It's time for the DC Universe to face their worst nightmares. This is the Night Terrors series, which is the next big crossover event that happened within the DC Universe in their new initiative, Dawn of DC. So if you've already seen Batman vs. Robin and Lazarus Planet, this is the next series that comes up after it. Them facing their worst nightmares. I hope you enjoy. It was a bright and sunny day as John D. laid out along the countryside with his wife and children. His wife nudges him, telling him that it's a beautiful summer day at the park, and he's missing it. He smiles as he wakes up. You're right. I was just having the most wonderful dream. It was full of characters and colorful costumes on a fantastic adventure. But you and the children, you weren't there. From the moment you've entered my life, something has been different. I can hardly remember what it was like before you. His wife tells him that it sounds lovely, and it reminds her of something that she's been meaning to ask him. They should have another child. But as John is listening, his wife's words become distorted and twisted as mucus and maggots begin to pour out of her mouth. John D. jumps up. No, no, this isn't right. But his transformed children run up grabbing him. Father, let's play. John himself becomes infected as he shouts, asking, Do you think you can fool me? My name is John D. Dr. Destiny. And dreams are my playground. And that is what this is. Now don't be shy. Show yourself. John calls out to the unknown intruder, and then he wanders through the park until he arrives at the Hall of Justice, asking, why is whoever this is showing him this? The Justice League disbanded like a bunch of quitters. It'll take more than that to scare him. The world continues to melt away into a grotesque version of what it once was, as John scoffs, stating, and once he finds his dream stone, he can regain control of the realm. And they will pay for this insult. He stops before a large portrait of the Justice League while staring at the mangled figures. And the individuals begin to jump out of the picture frames and they attack him. John struggles to remain in control, asking, How are you doing this? They're not real. What is wrong with their eyes? Where is the nightmare stone? And then he gets buried, screaming out, No! But back in the real world, Boston Brand, the hero known as Dead Man, finds himself enjoying a peaceful moment to himself in a graveyard. Dead Man's whole thing is that he is a dead ghost whose entire purpose is to help the world of the living. And you would think that being deceased is as about as lonely as one could expect, but he reminds himself that he does get visitors once in a while. But today, something's different. The wind of death blows past and he feels someone like him. Dead Man follows the trail and it leads him to Superman. But as anyone with eyes and a mind could tell, Superman is very much alive. The presence the Dead Man is feeling isn't Superman, but it's following Superman. And now, so shall Dead Man. Soon, Superman is called off by the League. Dead Man stays close until Superman meets up with Wonder Woman. She too has a ghostly vibe, just as Superman does. She died recently, and she and Dead Man got to spend some time together until she got better, and she left him here alone. But that's just another story of the living in the afterlife. She too has a ghostly vibe, just as Superman does. It's almost as if the two of them are haunted. Dead Man continues to monitor the two of them as they go to the Hall of Justice, and immediately Dead Man can see that there is something more crawling here, all over the place. They're not ghosts, but something from another realm is seeping into the world of the living. Batman then appears out of the shadows. Superman asks, why did Batman call them to the former Hall of Justice? Batman tells them that the alarm was tripped from the restricted area, and these three are the only ones with access to that location. The three head into the area unknown to most, and right away, they see everything in disarray, along with a body strung up before them. As they get closer, Batman recognizes the man as John D, Dr. Destiny. Superman asks if someone is trying to send them a message, and if so, why would they kill Dr. Destiny? Dead Man takes a closer look, examining the body, and realizes that this is what he felt. This is what is haunting the three of them. Whatever was here was searching for something. Wonder Woman asks, how did he get here? Superman says the last time they saw John D was when he was working with Deathstroke in the Dark Crisis event. John D was apprehended after that and brought to Arkham Asylum. But at that moment, Batman gets a call and asks, How did you get a hold of this number? 
Harley Quinn responds, Hey, Bats Baby! I was stopping off at Arkham Tower for a few medical supplies, and they got a bit of a boo-boo here. We need to talk about John D. Yeah, he escaped, we know. We're looking at his body right now. His body? What are you talking about? John D is here. He's having a violent nightmare. The doctors are doing everything they can to sedate him and nothing is working. But if you want, I can try to wake him up with a pow right in the kisser. Batman tells her to wait. He'll be there soon. Superman says that if this is magic related, they should call Zatanna right now. Batman begins to leave and Deadman yells, wait, wait, and he attempts to possess John D's body, but he bounces off and he quickly sees that this is not magic, but something else. With a little choice left, Deadman jumps into Batman's body. Batman, please don't be mad, but hey, wait, it's not magic. Wonder Woman looks at Batman, realizing that he's convulsing, and he seems to be going into a seizure, but is in control and talking. Is that dead man? Were you here the whole time? Listen, the realm of dreams and the world of death are connected. Related, you know, like brother and sister or something. I'm picking up something primordial, real bad mojo. Something is, uh, sapping into something very powerful and very dangerous. But before Deadman could go on, Batman forces Deadman out of his body by vomiting. Don't you ever do that again! I might not be able to hurt you, but I will help you into the light! Yeah, yeah, I get it. Sheesh, don't kill the messenger. Deadman says in his ghostly shape again. Well, it might not be magic, but I'll contact Zatanna and see if she can take a look, Wonder Woman says. And I'll stop by Supercorp and get an idea if anything has changed on a cosmic level. Superman tries to help. Batman tells the others that he'll head to Arkham Tower in Boston Brand. If you're still there, follow me, now. While everyone leaves the Hall of Justice with their own missions, a woman outside watches. And as everyone is gone, she grabs her phone. Ma'am, the Trinity has left Ground Zero in a hurry. Elsewhere, Amanda Waller looks at a series of monitors all watching the heroes. Hmm, it's been some time since the Trinity has been together again. Something wicked is coming. Moments later at Arkham Tower, Batman races in to see the doctors are holding John D down while he is screaming. If he finds the Nightmare Stone, it'll be the end of everything, please! His eyes! His eyes! His eyes! But before John could finish, his chest is suddenly torn apart. Everyone is staring in silence for a moment. The doctors walk up. There's nothing we could do, he's dead. Batman walks over to examine the wounds. These are identical to the ones that he had inside of the Hall of Justice. Bat, do you think that something in the Nightmare might have killed him? Batman tells Harley that it's in his dreams. And if it is in John D's dreams, then they're safe. Until we fall asleep, right? Right. John D's dream stone is locked up in the Hall of Justice. But what is the Nightmare Stone? Before anyone could even wonder any further, a ghostly voice comes out of John D's body. The real question is, where's the Nightmare Stone? John D was a smart man, and he hid the Nightmare Stone long ago in the dreams of his enemies. Maybe we could team up and find it. After I kill a few Robins, you can make me your new sidekick. The body jumps up onto the ceiling and John D's head spins around, snapping at the neck. You're Batman, the Dark Knight, hero of the world. You don't operate in the shadows. You merely hide there. You think you're the stuff of nightmares? You ain't seen nothing yet. Batman quickly throws a battering at the talking head. And as the blade makes a thunk, it sinks in with spiders crawling out of the wound and the voice returns. Oh, Batman, a battering, really? You're so out of your depth here. I had a dream once, that the world would finally see superheroes the way that I see them. Not as heroes, but as horrors. And wouldn't you know it, dreams do come true. The shadowy, disfigured creatures begin to rise up, and Deadman shouts out, These are nightmare constructs, but how are they in the real world? Meanwhile, back at the Hall of Justice, Zatanna is looking at the body. Deadman's right, this isn't a body, but a very powerful dream construct. Detective Chimp has a look at it. Boston might have been a risk taker in his former life, but he doesn't play around with the dead. We need to be careful. But the energy that attacked Arkham begins to lash out of the construct. And Zatanna quickly tries to hold it off, but it begins to put everyone to sleep. As Zatanna attempts to wake them up, nothing happens, and a voice asks, Do you see? Is the picture coming into focus? Superman is continuing on his way, but with no one at his side, 
He's quickly taken over by the dark energy. Now that I'm free, my nightmare can spread, not just to heroes and villains, but to everyone. And back at Arkham Tower, Batman calls to Oracle to contact Nightwing and Robin. Tell them as a red alert, Oracle. But the one inside of John D's body tells him that his efforts fall on deaf ears. It's nighty night for the whole world, and your sleepless nights will come to any who resist. Harley begins to yawn. Just as I thought, I was getting my tenth wind. Batman, however, is resisting sleep as long as he can until he activates the emergency protocol. No sleep till Gotham. Suddenly, Batman's heart is shocked, giving him enough adrenaline to fight off the creeping sleep. Whatever you are, I will not fall. I will not rest. I will not sleep until. But as Batman blinks, he finds himself somewhere else in a different time. He looks at his clothing. This is the suit I was wearing in the night, in Crime Alley. And a voice calls out, Son, is that you? As Batman finally succumbs to the sleep, Deadman yells for him to wake up, and when he gets no response, he sighs. Oh, Batman's gonna be mad, but I got no choice. He possesses Batman's body, suddenly springing into life, biting down on the construct, and kicking it back to give himself some distance. You know, normally I'd crack a joke right now, but I'm kind of in Batman's body, and it feels wrong to crack jokes. John D's body falls off the ceiling, calling out to Deadman. We are very similar, brother. You could be so much more than a hero, and yet you're forever trapped as a circus performer. I'm not scared of you. You're trapped in the nightmare realm. And the voice tells him, guess again. You know how they say the eyes are the window to the soul. The intruder inside John D begins to carve out his eyes and rip away the flesh. He invites Dead Man to join him, to help him find the nightmare stone. The newly transformed being, stripped of its very essence, reaches out grabbing Dead Man. We can make the heroes pay for what they did to you. Now tell your good friend Insomnia, what did the dead dream about? Long ago, Batman learned that many of his foes would constantly try to get into his head, whether it's through their mind games or their concoctions. They wanted to use his inner thoughts to control him. As Alfred looks down at the giant container of water, he asks if Batman is sure that this will put a stomp to it. Batman fits his rebreather, telling him that years ago, he studied in the caves of Nanda Parbat. He learned how to isolate his fears, but he must take it a step further. He knows his fears. Now he needs to know how to keep the others from using them against him. Alfred asks if he's sure that this is a good idea, forcing himself to do this. He worries what this might do to his psyche in the long term. What it might create in Batman. Batman pulls down his visor, telling him to only give him 24 hours, and at that time, wake him up. Do not jump in before that. As Batman floats alone in that container, he re-watches the moment that his parents died, over and over and over again. The movie, The Gun, Joe Chill. Bang, bang, bang. He emerges from his isolation, throwing the rebreather, shouting, I told you to only pull me out after 24 hours. And Alfred stares with a worried look. It has been 24 hours, sir. Batman rolls onto his back, coughing. I'll never be over that night that Joe Chill killed them. No matter how many times I witness it, nothing will ever take the pain of that night away except for the end of my mission in Gotham. But hopefully this experience will come in handy someday. Now we cut to the present day. Bruce Wayne has been put to sleep by insomnia. And in this dark and shady nightmare world, Bruce finds himself back at the moment his parents were shot and killed in Crime Alley. A voice calls out asking if it's him. It's been so long since they've seen him. He must hurry to his and his mother's side. Bruce yells out, No, you're not my father. I'm not a young boy in this alley. None of this is real. I remember now. John D was killed in Arkham Tower. You took over his dead body and you attacked us with giant spiders. All of this is a nightmare. I've trained for moments like this. All I need to do is wake up, but why can't I? At that moment, there's a rumble from behind and Bruce turns around to see the giant pearls from his mother rolling and bouncing down the alleyway to him. He runs, jumping through the door, but as he gets up, he sees the Monarch Theater. He gets up stating that they need to get some new tricks. 
He's faced many people who have hoped to use his last happy moment with his parents against him. Soon the lights go dark and a projector begins to roll and Batman laughs. Ha <laughs> ha, go ahead. There's nothing that can be shown that I don't already know. The screen counts down to one and the film begins to play what is happening in the real world. The battle that Batman is having in his waking state against insomnia, except Bruce isn't in control of his body. That's why he's stuck in this nightmare as a child. Wait, that means that if I'm trapped in my nightmares, the only reason I'd still be fighting out there. Oh no, Boston. Bruce shouts out to dead men. What are you doing? I told you to never take over my body. I can't wake up because you're driving it. Get out now, Boston. But as frustrated young Bruce gets ready to tear down the screen, the screen reaches out, pulling him in. The next time that Bruce blinks, he finds himself not in the theater, but at his parents' home. He looks down at the graves of his mother and his father and Alfred, stating that he's not impressed. He can stop trying to use his parents' deaths against him, or anyone else's for that matter. He looks beyond to see more graves appearing, all with the names of his sons and daughters, and then a voice telling him, they aren't doing anything. That's part of the fun. Bruce is the one controlling the tour of his nightmares. I'm just along for the ride, Insomnia tells him. Bruce turns back to see Insomnia wearing a Robin costume. I'm a really big fan. I grew up in Gotham, lived out this whole traumatic life. It's always so cool that not only did we have our very own superhero, but it was Batman. In fact, I'd love to be your sidekick. All you'd have to do is help me find the Nightmare Stone. Dr. Destiny hid it in the nightmares of one of the heroes. And if you tell me where it's at, the nightmare will be over. For everyone. Bruce looks up at the imposing man. You're the creature that took over John D's body. What are you? I'm the thing that goes bump in the night. The Boogeyman, your worst nightmare. You can call me Insomnia. Soon there's a rumble as the dead bodies from the graves begin to rise up. So what'll it be? You win? Bruce begins to fight off the corpses. If you think that I had any issue fighting against my own fears, you're mistaken. But that's what Selena walks forward telling him. Say yes to insomnia, and we can try this marriage thing again. You should listen to her. You wouldn't want the cat to leave you again, would you? But this is the real truth, isn't it? Your greatest fear is happiness. Bruce smacks Insomnia's arm away. I am not afraid of being happy, or of you. I face down the Joker, and you are not. But before Bruce could finish his sentence, he begins to cough. Oh, oh, what's that? Does the cat have your tongue? Or is it something else? Bruce continues to choke until something rises out of his throat until he coughs out a giant thing. Bruce begins trying to regain himself, but he sees the thing that came out of him was a giant bat with a gun for a head. The bat screams as it starts to shoot at him, and Bruce runs. What is that? When you became Batman, you turned yourself into a creature of the night. You transformed yourself into a symbol of nightmares. But now the nightmare has a mind of its own, Bruce. Bruce begins to try and outrun the bat gun monster until he's finally hit and Insomnia bursts out laughing. <laughs> bang, bang! How does it feel to have your own darkness turned against you, Brucey? Bruce begins to pick himself back up. You know, I should thank you. I actually felt that and it freed me. I know what I must do now. I have to go deeper into my own nightmare, into my own mind to regain control of my body from dead man. The now fully grown and fully armored Bruce Wayne stands up, throwing a pair of batarangs at the bat creature. And once I'm done, I'm coming for you, Insomnia! Insomnia laughs. Ha ha ha, you are making a big mistake. You keep bringing fears. I am no Jonathan Crane. It's been said before, but you're the one building this nightmare. You have lived in the darkness. You have thought some of the worst scenarios known to man. If you go too deep into your own mind, Batman, there's no telling what you might find. Bruce travels down into the dark cave, into his inner nightmares, and he's transported once more. When he looks around, he finds himself back in Crime Alley. Except, he is Joe Chill. 
He points the gun at his own father. No, 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 I'm not in control, I'm not! Bang. That is the conclusion to part one of Batman's worst nightmare. But as a backup in this issue, we see what Damien is doing. So let's go into Robin's worst nightmare. As the winds die down on a temple in the desert, the old man is sitting inside opening his eyes, saying that only a small number of people are mad enough to brave the sandstorms. Have you come to kill me, Damien Wayne? Damien steps in. My grandfather used to speak to me in whispers, a master of sleep and dreams. I'm sorry about Ra's al Ghul's passing. He was an old friend, but what do you want? I had a nightmare. At first I thought it faded from my thoughts, but I knew better. I kept searching my mind and all I get are images. Images of a man traveling across the dreamscape in search of something. It's like it's on the tip of my mind hidden away from me. We must use whatever resources there are to unlock my dreams. I have to understand what's been shown to me so that I may defeat it. The old man grabs a handful of sand, pouring it into a small hourglass. What you're asking for is dangerous. The land of dreams is a sacred place. Your grandfather tried to learn how to access it and he failed, and now you have exactly one minute to prove yourself in ways others before you could not. At that moment, a group of ninjas appear and Damien gets to work quickly dispatching them. As he stands back up, he looks at the old man. It would really be in everyone's best interest if you stopped comparing me to everyone. The old man stands up and begins to walk. The books are this way. You're just as annoying as your grandfather was. Damien begins to look through scrolls and parchments, trying to discover ways to unlock his dreams. But he learns that he must sleep properly first. Damien looks at another scroll, depicting an image of insomnia fighting and defeating Dead Man. Wait, this! At that moment, Batman calls out over the comms that they have a red alert. Emergency protocols. Activate no sleep till Gotham. Damien turns to leave, but suddenly the energy that Insomnia used to put the world to sleep washes over the temple. The old man says not to worry. They have trained for decades. The Nightmare Stone and its powers will have no effect on... Damien tries to fight his way towards the old man, but before he can reach him, he falls to the ground. Moments later, Damien opens his eyes. It worked. I can stay awake. And I remember my nightmare. I must find my father. And then insomnia will pay. The world has become a dark and twisted version of itself, as insomnia has put everyone to sleep with his nightmare wave. And now the heroes are trying to wake up as they fight their greatest fears. But for one man who can't sleep, Dead Man is forced to face insomnia alone as he possesses Batman's body in an effort to try and fight insomnia. Insomnia just has one question for him. Will you join me and help me find the Nightmare Stone so that you, dead man, can dream of a happy life? As Insomnia's grip tightens around Batman's throat, dead man tells him, I thought you were a ghost like me, but you're not! <laughs> You've got me all figured out then, huh? Come on, where did John D hide the stone? Is it in the waking world, or is it within the nightmares of one of your so-called heroes? Dead Man manages to break free. If you're from the dreams, how are you in the real world? What are you? Can't you tell already? I am the god of nightmares. I can not only bring your worst fears into reality, but also everyone else's. And don't worry, it'll be fun. The doctors of Arkham mean well. They only wish to help. Insomnia says, referencing the mangled creatures coming out of the Arkham staff as Dead Man in the body of Batman is battling Insomnia in Arkham Tower. These monsters all tackle Dead Man, but Dead Man knows that he can't hurt them. There's still people in there living their own nightmares. However, there is something else, a door. And it has the same haunting feeling that was present at the Hall of Justice. But for now, that door, it has to wait. Because Dead Man has to stop Insomnia and he knows just how. For a brief, unguarded moment, Dead Man leaps out of Batman's body and straight into Insomnia's. What are you doing? Let's just see how much you like having your mind invaded. As soon as Dead Man enters Insomnia's mind, he begins to see images. 
he discovers that the Nightmare Stone was created long ago by a sacrifice, a tormented hero, and a long lost cause. Dr. Destiny used to possess the Dreamstone, but John D. stole it and manipulated it into something broken and twisted. But he feared this Nightmare Stone that he had made, so he hid it. Insomnia is now looking through the nightmares of heroes and villains for any clues as to where it was and he started here, in Arkham Tower. Deadman looks around at the tower before all of this happened, but something was different. He's back in time, he sees where this started, and he feels the rain, but he realizes this rain is green. This rain is the Lazarus rain. Lazarus Island erupted, and it brought down the rain that was cursed with magic. It changed people, gave them new powers, but it also changed insomnia. His powers didn't come out of any nightmares. It came out of being exposed to the Lazarus rain. He's one of the monsters that was created in the battle against Ra's al Ghul, and it gave him the ability to spy on people's minds as they slept. At first, Insomnia started with the other inmates of Arkham, like Dr. Destiny, which is when he discovered everything he needed to know. He was then able to spy on the heroes, except in his dreams, the heroes are the monsters. But why? That's when Deadman realizes that there is something more. That Insomnia is hiding something, a light, a memory buried away. And it feels like joy. Insomnia screams, pushing Dead Man out of his head. Oh, that's rich. You get to invade the minds of others, but you're the big no-no? But that's the confusing part. I've been inside of a few heads, and usually they hide their worst memories, but you? You're hiding your happy ones. Why? You dare invade the mind of a god of nightmares. Dead Man then transfers himself back into Batman's body. You're not god. You're just some dude. John D. wouldn't tell you where the Nightmare Stone was, so you killed him. And now, I might know just who created it. Insomnia shouts to bring him to him, but Deadman turns, running for a window. Sorry, Bats! This is gonna hurt! Deadman breaks through the glass, grabbing a hold of the spawning tendrils that are covering the buildings, making his way down, swinging and leaping until landing perfectly on the ground. <laughs> just like old times. People can say what they want about Batman, but that dude works out. This is easily the most fit person that I have ever possessed. Deadman looks around and notices the Batmobile still there, and he starts getting in it. Batman's gonna be super mad. It's wrong to steal his body, but I just can't leave him behind. And I guess I'm taking the Batmobile. Any one of Insomnia's creations could kill his body if I leave it here. Besides, whose body is it better to be in to solve a mystery than one of the world's greatest detectives in the world, right? Insomnia watches as Deadman drives off. Let him run. And then he grabs his chest in pain. The Nightmare Realm is pulling me back. Without the stone, my time is limited. Insomnia waves his hand to create more nightmares, stating to rise his sleepless nights and follow Dead Man. While I watch the nightmares of Dead Man's friends, you will search for the Nightmare Stone in the land of the living and kill any and all who are still awake. A short while later, Dead Man arrives at his destination, mulling over the fact of the one clue he had from his encounter. That it was the Lazarus Rain that created insomnia. Most of the Lazarus Rain was wiped off the face of the earth. It does everything from give people new powers to reviving the dead. But thankfully, Batman kept a small amount of it. Dead Man looks down at a grave. This is feeling a bit morbid, even for me, but I need some help and some answers. Soon a hand breaks free out of the stone coffin, and the old, decayed body begins to climb out. Sorry about this, but the world is in danger. A lunatic has trapped the world inside of their own nightmares, and I'm searching for something called the Nightmare Stone. It's going to be up to us to find the truth and stop him. I promise. Once we solve this case, I'll... But after handing over a hat, a gas gun, and a gas mask, Sandman tells him, Say no more. I've always loved a good mystery. After rising from his grave and putting on his mask, Sandman looks up. You're not really Batman, are you? How do you know? Deadman asks. Well, you're a ghost possessing the body of a man who dresses like a bat to fight crime, talking to a resurrected hero from lifetimes ago who had prophetic dreams about crimes to come. And that is what you question? And I still don't know why I was resurrected in the first place. 
There's a mention of a man named Insomnia. Dead Man begins to explain what has happened. How the world was hit by a nightmare blast in search of an item called the Nightmare Stone. And while inside of Insomnia, there were glimpses of Sandman inside. Do you have any idea why? Sandman sighs. I remember the Nightmare Stone. It was a bad case, one that haunted me. At first, it was a cult who worshipped some god of nightmares, you know the kind, all about sex and money. And then it took a nasty turn. It was supposed to be a sacrifice, but I stopped it just before the leader could commit the act. However, I was wrong on who the leader was. Turns out the one being sacrificed was the real leader, and he finished the job. So, there it was. It looked like a head of nightmares itself. It slowly manifested. You could feel the power coming out of it. The issue they ran into is that the death potion was a dud. The only thing that they were sacrificing was a headache the next morning. And the one lone sacrifice, well, that wasn't enough to make the stone real. And soon, it was gone. I saw many things with the Justice Society, but there was something about this case. Dr. Fate once told me that an item that could bridge the dreams and waking world was dangerous, and it should never fall into their wrong hands. Dead man looks at him. All right, that should give me enough to work with. Now let's get you back in the grave before you start craving brains. Didn't you hear me? That case has haunted me. I have a certain responsibility to finish this. Fine, but I don't really know where to go next. At that moment, the Batmobile receives a transmission, asking for help at Terrific Tech, asking if any heroes are still awake, and if they are, please respond. Ah, so the plot thickens. Sandman and Deadman get into the Batmobile. What about the cult? Are there any members alive? That was ages ago. They would all be long dead by now. But the leader did in fact have an heir, and though he may be old, he dreamed of his youth and wealth. And then we find him, surrounded by gold and luxury. One of his masked servants begins to pour a glass of wine, asking, Sir, may I ask a question? You dare speak to me! I will have your head for this! But Insomnia pulls off his mask. Who doesn't love a man who jumps right to executions? This is a fancy dream. Your old man would be proud. The young man says that his father has been dead for almost 80 years, and Asomnia says, Your daddy attempted to capture a piece of living horror. Where is it? Where is the Nightmare Stone? All right, fine. I'll play along, dream guy. I spoke to mediums and mystics. No one ever knew. My father's actions with the cult ruined my family name, and I was forced to build it all by myself. Oh, I'd imagine the $20 million trust fund he left behind had nothing to do with that. Your father only wanted the stone to increase his wealth. So, if you want money, have at it. Insomnia begins to force feed the young man bags of gold coins over and over until finally his body explodes with wealth. With another dead end, Insomnia sighs. It's not here. Where or oh, where did you hide it, John D? Sleepless nights. Find dead man. Maybe my new partner is having more luck finding it. A short while later, over at Terrific Tech, Red Tornado rushes in asking, Batman, how are you awake? And when dead man tells him that it's him, Red Tornado is taken back. Jeez, don't look too disappointed, Red Tornado. It's not that. We just need all the help we can get right now, and with most every person asleep, the world has been thrown into chaos. As Red Tornado leads Deadman and Sandman into the next room, Mr. Terrific floats in a tube, and Red Tornado says that even the smartest man fell victim to the attack. But it's much worse than this. These readings show that everyone's minds are sinking deeper and deeper into their comas. The longer the world spends in the Nightmare Realm, the less connection they all have to their bodies. Eventually, there won't be anyone left to wake up. Dead Man thinks about it. Insomnia was freed from the Nightmare Realm and must have released a lot of Nightmare energy. But he wanted this so he could be searching for the Nightmare Stone. Then he shakes his head. This is too much for me. I'm just a ghost and before that a trapeze artist. I'm not really the type to save the... But that's when he suddenly screams, falling to his knees. Sandman runs over asking, what's wrong? Deadman gets up explaining that when he tried to enter Insomnia's body, it left the two of them connected. 
and Dead Man can see Insomnia's nightmares. Soon there's a shift, and Dead Man is brought into Insomnia's dreams, or rather, his past. Just before the Lazarus rain fell, just before he got his powers. The doctors felt that they should try and give Insomnia an awake day, so that he could try and get some socialization in. And who better to pair him up with than John D. Considering they both struggle with dreams and reality, it might do them well. As Insomnia is wheeled to the table with John, he mutters to himself about how his dream stone was stolen from him. Insomnia sits there listening while he hears over the news that Black Adam has crashed into the Hall of Justice and announced that the Justice League are dead. It seemed hearing the hero's demise was the only thing that could make Insomnia happy. That was until the news anchor informs them all that the Justice League has returned alive and well. This set off something in Insomnia as he stood up from his wheelchair, throwing things, shouting, What? Why do they get to come back from the dead and not us? What makes them so special? I will not rest until the whole world sees the Justice League for what they are. They are. Before Insomnia could continue attacking and kicking the guards, a nurse injects him with a sedative and knocking him out. The doctor says to call security and then prep the sleeping aids. Mr. Lucas here needs to go back to sleep. He's too dangerous awake. Deadman watches it all, stating that they kept him asleep. Did they torture him? Why did they want him to stay? But before he could wonder any further, Insomnia screams for Deadman to get out of his head, and Deadman is forcibly rejected out. Deadman sits back up in Batman's body, yelling. And Sandman asks, what did he see? He explains that it was part of his past and that he could feel frustration He's still trapped inside of the Nightmare Realm, and he's not having any luck finding the Nightmare Stone. Sandman thinks, if you can connect it to Insomnia and figure out where he was, does that mean that he can do the same? Before Deadman could respond, the lights go out. And Sandman asks, isn't Insomnia trapped in the Nightmare Realm? But Deadman explains, yeah, but not his sleepless nights. Deadman tries looking around, telling Sandman that they have to get out of here. They can't face the sleepless nights, but where is Red Tornado? At that moment, Red Tornado calls out to them, and as they get closer to the voice, Red Tornado says that they should have stayed in Arkham Tower. It's way past your bedtime time time. And as they get closer, they can see a sleepless knight holding Red Tornado's head, using it like a puppet. As the dead man and Sandman are pushed further and further into a corner, they realize that they need to figure out a way to lure the constructs away from Mr. Terrific as he hangs defenseless in his sleeping containment tube. But just as the two of them make their way to a window to jump out of it, they get some unexpected help in the form of Batman's son, Damian Wayne, as he leaps in, slicing through the sleepless nights. While Damian gets to work on the next of them, Sandman asks, How old is this kid? Damien yells back, How old are you? You're still wearing a fedora. Just get to the roof so that we can get out of here. As the three of them make it outside, the bat plane hovers in the air. Everyone jumps onto the rope ladder just in time to escape. As everyone climbs inside of it, Deadman tells Damien that his father would be proud of him. But Damien spins back, drawing his sword. Stop literally putting words in my father's mouth. I and my father have been possessed enough times. Get out of his body, now. Dead man sighs, all right, all right. And dead man exits Batman's body with Sandman asking Damien how he's even awake. I had a nightmare. Insomnia was in my dreams. He wanted me to forget, so I trained my mind to control my dreams, but also the art of staying awake. I've used every single meditation technique that I've ever learned. The whole world has been asleep for a few hours, but for me, it feels like it's been weeks. I can still feel the nightmares pulling at me. Deadman says that they need to know more about what Insomnia knows if they're going to find the Nightmare Stone before he does. And Sandman asks, aren't you still connected to him? Deadman looks at him, well, I could take a peek. Deadman begins to concentrate as he connects his mind back with Insomnia to find any sort of lead but sees him before he changed into Insomnia. He goes back to a time when Insomnia was attending a survivor's meeting. The speaker tells him that they're glad that he joined their session. He does seem a bit on edge. Insomnia finishes his coffee. Yeah, I haven't slept in days. I'm doing everything that I can to keep my eyes open. 
I got arrested trying to buy something to stay awake, but the cops knew my story and just let me off the hook. The speaker says what happened to him was traumatic. A tragedy that no one should ever have to endure. But he needs rest. And hopefully one day, he can forgive the Justice League. But that is what infuriates Insomnia. As he takes the coffee pot, smashing it over the speaker's head. Forgive them! I'll show you! He begins to stab the speaker with the broken shards of glass, and then his attention turns to the other people until he's the only one left. He looks at the piece of glass. All I want is for everyone to have their eyes open to the truth. But to do that, well, I'll have to lead by example and remove my own eyelids. After making quick slices, Insomnia smiles. I'll never sleep again. Not until the Justice League pays for what they've done. But I wouldn't go any further. Dead man, you won't like what you find in here. As Dead Man is pushed back out, he screams. And Sandman says that he hopes that it was worth it. Dead Man begins to think about what he might have been. Insomnia was growing frustrated and he couldn't find the stone. It's not in the nightmares of the heroes or the villains. So Damien then says that the only other place that it would be is somewhere between the waking and the dreaming. Sandman stands up and tells him that if that's the case, I might be of some help. Later, at Wayne Enterprises, Sandman is collecting the ingredients, stating that in his past life, he was a chemist, you know, before he was raised from the dead and turned into a zombie. That's how he developed his special sleep gas. Over the years, he experimented with different formulas and concoctions. Some of them could put people into comas, and others could manipulate the dreams and the nightmares. Now, this formula will put them all into a state where they're not quite awake, but they're not quite dreaming. Are you sure you want to do this, Damien? Damien tells him that if Dead Man fails, which is likely, he will continue. This is partially his fault anyway. And Dead Man tells him, well, I can't argue with that. As Sandman pulls the trigger, the room begins to fill with a blue mist. And just as the Dead Man begins to ask how long it's going to take, the two are transported to this new realm. But while Sandman sets them down, one of the sleepless nights bursts in. Aw, oh, crap, I thought I'd have more time. Now it's just me alone against a nightmare. On guard! Meanwhile, elsewhere, Damien lands on the ground of this new place asking, Is this the in-between? Empty and limbo? Dead Man says that it's called The Hollow. Not quite the waking world or the dreamscape. This is the space that they can see out of the corners of their eyes. He's heard it's called the reality stream as well. It doesn't take long before the pair begin to hear their names called out, and as they look up, they see two eyes looking down on them. The two walk up to the old house. Damien looks up to see the set of eyes looking down, and says that Insomnia is searching the nightmares, but he can't push into this realm. And Dead Man says, This house. I visited the house of secrets, and now the house of mystery. This must be the house of horror. We must be close to the nightmare stone. The two step through the doors, and everything begins to change as the inside turns into a circus ring. Dead Man says that he can feel the Nightmare Stone. It wants to be found. This is why he could feel Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman were haunted. The Nightmare Stone wants him to find it. Damien looks off into the center of the ring, asking, what is that? Because it looks like a body. And Dead Man looks at the body. I know who that is. It's my lies. I always used to tell people that I was dead before I even hit the ground. That wasn't true. I felt the bullet. I felt the impact. Damien asks, why would the Nightmare Stone show them this? Dead Man says, because it's a test. Just like Wesley Dodds stopped the cult leader in his time to possess the Nightmare Stone, it takes a sacrifice. So Dead Man plunges his arm into the withering body, and as it begs for him to stop, Dead Man digs deeper. In the real world, Sandman holds his ground against the construct, but just as it gets ready to deliver a killing blow, it begins to glow and is suddenly exploded. The guts and blood splatter everywhere as Sandman looks up to see Deadman and Damien have returned. But Deadman is now holding the Nightmare Stone. I have the stone. We could stop Insomnia, and then his dreams will come true. As the echo of the gunshot faded away, the young Bruce looked at himself. Why? Why would he do this? An older Bruce says, There's no way that I can answer that question. His younger self tells him, That's a lie. I'm sorry, but this is all just a dream. The younger Bruce jumps up, grabbing his older counterpart by the face, shouting, It's because of you! 
He killed them because of you! You wanted this. You wanted to be Batman, just admit it. His younger self begins to take on the appearance and sounds of insomnia. Batman pushes him off. The child looks at him again. I'm not insomnia. We are the same. This is all that you are. After everything that you've done, there's a reason that you always come back to this alley. Because there's a piece of you trapped here forever. As the nightmare versions begin to multiply and attack, Batman struggles to fend them off, telling them that he doesn't have to fight them. He just needs to do what he never wanted to do. He needs to let go. He needs to let the nightmare take control. Just what it seemed like the nightmares had won. Batman jumps into the air with a new sense of determination. One that he knew he'd only given the power of to others. Batman never wished to have Superman's powers, but here in his dreams, it takes on a different meaning. One that he will unpack once this is all over. But he can't spend too much time dwelling in his own dreams and his own nightmares. This is not the real Gotham. It's how his mind is processing the nightmare realm that Insomnia is trying to trap him in. He just needs to skip past it. He needs to go deeper. Deeper into the garden of his dreams that need tending to. One full of weeds. A weed called the Dead Man, who has control of his body. His mind catalogs its dreams. Some are glimpses into his complicated heart, while some are lies. He needs to shock his system to shake Dead Man out of his body. And moments later, Batman lands in front of a black door. There's a loud bat boom as he makes landfall. And for the briefest of moments, Batman smiles. Did you really just smile at yourself? Here, look at what you've created, what your dreams have made. This pet of yours is two pieces of you combined. The symbol that you've embraced and the one that you denied. A gun and a bat. The perfect version of you. And what could this door have behind it? Is this door where Dr. Destiny hid the Nightmare Stone? Because it really looks like someone wanted to keep people out. Is the Nightmare Stone in your nightmares, Batman? Batman stands up. I don't have the Nightmare Stone. Oh yeah, I'm sure you're telling me the truth because heroes can be trusted, right? Open the door! Let me have what's inside! Or you can be lost in your own nightmares until the end of time. Batman looks within himself. I've been obsessing with control for years. What you've shown me is that my dreams will give me what I need to win. And now you can get out. Or I'll show you something really scary. A reimagined Batman radiates with energy. The ultimate Batman. One who has accepted his own fears. Insomnia looks at him. You're not playing by the rules anymore. Get him, Gunbat! The Gunbat begins to shoot, but Batman holds out his hands, stopping the bullets. No. Insomnia gets ready to conjure up more nightmares, but he feels a tug. Something is happening out of the land of nightmares. I'm being pulled away. Maybe you were right. After all, Batman. And as Insomnia is fading away, he begins to laugh. Maybe you should have taken my offer after all. But now it's too late. The gun bat lunges in and Batman grabs it by the metal barrel, ripping it off. I don't scare easily. He then turns back to the chained door, beginning to unlock it. Dr. Destiny didn't put this door here. I did. The door opens and Batman begins to walk up the stairs, telling himself, This is not a part of my nightmare. This is me. Insomnia was right about one thing. There's a piece of me forever in that alleyway. The sound of gunshots are not unusual in Gotham. So when my parents died, it didn't draw any attention. I was alone with my parents' bodies for 90 minutes before a beat cop happened to pass by. But none of that is the nightmare that I hid behind the black door. This boy was alone in the alley and he made a promise to himself, a vow of vengeance to make sure that what happened to him will never happen to anyone else. Ever since that day, I've wondered, if the boy in the alley saw me today, would he be scared or disappointed in what I've become? The young Bruce sits down. He cries that his family is gone, that he's all alone. And Batman kneels down. In this moment, he may think that this mission is his and his alone. 
but he's never alone. He'll have a life unlike anything he's ever expected. For a long time, this boy is going to live in the shadows, isolated, hidden and shielded away from anything but that mission, but others will find him in the dark, friends that he couldn't possibly imagine. Some can fly and shoot fire from their eyes, others can stop bullets with their bracelets, and some are so fast that they break the speed barrier. The children will make him into a better man. The young Bruce looks up and he wipes tears from his eyes. What you're saying sounds like a dream. It's more than that. It's your family. Batman embraces his younger self, pulling back his mask. Thank you. And the young Bruce looks at him. I'm proud of you. But why are you dressed like a bat? Because bats are scary. And the young Bruce looks again. And bats are cool. As a light is shown down on him, Batman can feel himself being pulled away. It's like... Dead Man isn't in control anymore, Batman finally is, when suddenly there's a voice shouting for him to wake up, and a glimpse of Zoran R, the psychotic Batman within his mind. Batman tries to regain control, and the black door slams shut, and Batman screams. And then he looks around. Where am I? Arkham Tower? My body is so sore and exhausted, what did Dead Man do to me? At that moment, Batman looks out the window, seeing that there are still nightmares plaguing Gotham. I'm still in the nightmare, but a familiar voice comes out of the shadows. No, father, this is the real world, and we've lost. Damien, Deadman Batman, and zombified Sandman stand at the entrance of Arkham Tower, prepared to enter and defeat Insomnia for good. Dead Batman looks up, reminding his companions that Insomnia's nightmares revealed that his real body is inside. He holds up the crystal skull that is the Nightmare Stone. The Nightmare Stone whispers to me. It will lead the way to insomnia. It wants me to purge the powers from his body and free everyone from his control, Dead Batman says. The three heroes enter the tower. We're entering the lion's den, where insomnia holds the most power. It's best that we all go together, Sandman reminds them. But instead of a nightmare realm, the three heroes find the inside of the tower is quite clean and bright. It throws them off. Elevator or stairs? Sandman asks as he motions through the lobby. The three of them begin to climb the stairs, and as they make their way up, Damien stumbles for a mere second. He puts his hand on the rail, and dead Batman turns back to him. Son, I want you to know that I'm very proud of you. Batman explains that Dead Man left his body, and he went on ahead, believing that he could defeat Insomnia alone. And he smiles at Damien. You don't have to keep going. We can go home now, father and son, finally together again, Batman says, and Damien steps forward, stabbing Batman through the chest. You're not my father, he growls. Damien stumbles as Sandman shakes him awake. Damien, wake up! You fell asleep when we were going up the stairs. In front of them, dead Batman is continuing onward. Keep an eye on him, Dodds. This will all be over soon, Boston Brand says from the body of Batman. They arrive at the top floor where they discover Insomnia's room, and inside, the villain is laying in the bed, locked in an endless sleep, his sheets stained by the Lazarus rain that dripped through the ceiling, giving him his powers. This is him? Damien asks, and Boston Brand nods, explaining that he was a killer who refused to sleep for fear of his nightmares. That's when he was committed to the tower. The doctors then induced sleep into him. So he's trapped like this, Sandman asks. Dead Batman shakes his head, lifting the nightmare stone. Not for long, he says softly. Boston flies out of Batman's body, leaping into Insomnia's body. He then enters his dreams. He sees what the villain tried to hide. Boston finally sees what happened. He looks around, realizing that he is in Gotham City, and he sees the real insomnia. Christopher Lucas, who had come home from work to help his family. Their neighborhood had been ordered to evacuate when the Justice League was fighting against the evil Batman in Dark Knight's Metal. Lucas' son was rushing into his arms when the building came down around them. Lucas was pulling himself out of the rubble when he realized that his wife, two sons, and daughter had all been crushed. He screams for the Justice League to help him as he tries to dig through the destruction, but they never came. Dead Man looks at the horrible scene as Lucas falls to his knees, crying. 
I'm sorry. Dead man whispers, but Lucas stands up. Sorry. This is what I dream about. This is what I see when I close my eyes. You get it now, don't you, dead man? Don't you see? Lucas asks him as he stands, lightning crackle, and it is now insomnia that stands before him. He glares at Deadman, explaining that the so-called heroes of the world created half the danger that they're suffering from. Killing them won't bring back your family. Deadman says to Insomnia, but the villain smiles. I don't want to kill them. The death of my family was my nightmare, and the Justice League made it into a reality. So I thought I'd return the favor. Insomnia says more lightning crackling as Insomnia explains that he wants the world to see the heroes as he does, as horrors. Dead man holds up the nightmare stone. I'm going to free you from this, Insomnia, so maybe you can finally find some peace, he says. But Insomnia laughs, explaining that this was all by design. He showed dead man the clues that led him to the nightmare stone. I wanted you to bring me the stone. Did you forget the rules of this whole game? If you die in the nightmares, you die in real life too. Insomnia says before his fingers turn into claws and he rips the heart out of his own chest. Back in the real world, Damien and Sandman look down as Insomnia's body begins to convulse. Energy begins to pour out of the villain's mouth, ripping it through the building. What the hell is happening? Damien shouts, and all around the world, the heroes begin to wake up. Batman suddenly sitting up from the floor, shocked by how exhausted and worn out his body feels. Dead man, what did you do to me? He growls, stalking over to the window, and is shocked to see his city overrun by nightmare creatures. I'm still in the nightmare? Batman questions, but Damien speaks from behind him. No, father, this is the real world, and we lost. He motions out the window, explaining that this wasn't about finding the Nightmare Stone. Insomnia wanted to make the nightmares real. Over at the Hall of Justice, Deadman and Sandman are pinned outside the walls, crucified. And Insomnia stands at the entrance, calling forth his demonic versions of the Justice League from the Nightmare Realm, smiling. Come out and play. Show the world what you really are, he whispers as we see the godlike Wonder Woman, the bat with a gun for a head, and the Super Reaper arriving in the real world. As the world was put to sleep, the heroes began to dream. Except those dreams were so real that they became nightmares. And for Barry Allen, it was another day at work. While collecting evidence at a crime scene, Barry thinks back to when Iris found out his secret. She didn't ask the usual questions like, can he outrun Superman? Can he eat whatever he wants? Instead, she wanted to know how he saw the world. At first, he didn't know how to answer. How could you describe the color blue to someone who's never seen it? And that's when it hit him. He told her that it was like a dream. Because in a dream, everything runs together. Everything repeats. Simple objects become charged with meaning. People you've known your entire life greet you as strangers. Every clock is set to eternity. Iris looked at him differently after that, till one day she asked him how he could tell the difference between being awake and dreaming. He told her that he was a scientist. He gathers data and he works the angles. She didn't seem satisfied with that, so when she pushed, he told her the truth. When you're awake, you can stop running. But while working, Barry receives a call from Iris telling him that he needs to come to the Van Buren Memorial. He asks if everything's okay, is she hurt? She says that she's fine. It's Wall. But before she could even finish stating Wally's name, Barry races over asking if Linda's there, and Iris sniffles, asking, who's Linda? Barry begins to respond, wants to tell Iris that that is Wally's wife, but he stops himself asking, what happened? Iris tells him that Jay said that Wally took on Grodd by himself. What was he thinking? Barry is stunned. I just went for milkshakes with him a few hours ago. Jay then walks up, stating that it happened on his side of the bridge, on his watch. If only he'd been faster. If he hadn't blown out his ankle on his way to get to Wally, maybe he could have. Grodd has gotten his hands on the Spear of Destiny, haven't seen the wretched thing since him and Ted went after the Dragon King. He was using it to amplify his telepathic powers, the usual routine. But when Kid Flash got in his way, they say that Kid Flash slowed down. Barry rushes over, grabbing Jay. You let him fight Grodd alone? 
Barry, I got there as fast as I could. We both know what Wally's capable of. The kid's like a ramjet. You should go see him. He's been asking for you. It's bad. Barry pushes open the door to Wally's room, and he can already tell how bad things are just from the breathing. It's ragged, it's shallow. It's the most unnatural sound that he's ever heard. He could hear Jay going on about how they say the doctors can't stop the bleeding. Barry begins to question himself. How could he let this happen? How could he let Wally even put on this costume? And why is he expecting it to be red? This is the Kid Flash costume. It's yellow. Why is red on his mind? Barry pushes the thought out, telling himself not to panic. Remember, solutions can always be reverse engineered from the problem itself. Wally coughs. I, I let you down. I was too slow. And Barry reaches out, telling him not to worry. They'll get this all straightened out. Wally says that it was the speed force. The speed force was wrong. There was something burrowed into it like a tick. I saw a monster in the lightning. Barry then races over to Iron Heights where Grodd was taken after the fight, asking for Warden Jeffries. But Warden Wolf tells him that Jeffries was before his time. And they've already met several times before. Barry shakes his head, right, of course, it's been a long day, Wolf. And should I be asking why there are bloodstains on the floors of the cells here? Wolf says that that's just the latest prisoner fad. Some of the guests have been cutting off their own eyelids to stay awake. Though Lord only knows why, it can really mess with your appetite. Trickster, one of the inmates who removed his own eyelids, grabs the cell doors, yelling out, Hey, we, we need you to settle a bet, Flash! I bet Snart five cigarettes that we disappear when you sleep. Snart says that it's the other way around. Which is it, Flash? Are you dreaming us? Or are we dreaming you? Barry stops for a moment to almost entertain the question, but he walks off telling him that he doesn't have time for this. As Barry reaches Grodd's cell, Grodd scoffs, telling him, I was wondering when you'd show up. I'm here about the boy. Whatever you and your accomplice did, he's fading, and you're going to help me fix him. Accomplice? Sorry, but you must be mistaken. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have some light reading to catch up on. Maybe I'll be in more of a talkative mood tomorrow. Barry begins to fill with rage. I need to know what happened. And Grodd sighs. Fine. The boy was running towards me and I raised the spear defensively, fully expecting to hit air. And then the boy slowed. Ha! Happy accident, nothing more. Barry demands to know what slowed down Wally. He mentioned a monster in the lightning. Does that mean anything to you? I only know what you know. Isn't that how this works? But if there was something or someone cheering me on from the sidelines, do thank him for me, Flash. Anger sets in and Barry begins to vibrate his way through the door and begins to beat Grodd. And Grodd laughs. You can feel it right, the time, all out of sync. People, places, things all jumbled together. Barry pulls himself back, looking at his bloodied hands. This isn't me. I don't do this, it's all upside down. Linda, the ward in Wally's costume. As the security begins to pull Barry away, he begins to shout, asking, Grodd, what's happening? Answer me. Someone's watching you, even here, careening into the walls of a rat maze that they built just for you. Barry heads to the watchtower, telling himself that he knows people are always warning him not to mess with the time stream. But what if someone else is messing with it already? However, his thoughts are stopped as he's punched right in the stomach and a voice says, Oh man, I'm sorry. It's just, nobody comes up here to see me. I, I thought you were an enemy, Barry. The green construct fades, and Barry wonders if that's Hal. A dead, burned, and decaying Hal looks at him. In the flesh, well, some of it. What's with the look? Didn't anyone tell you? I saved the world! I absorbed the Sun Eater. It killed me. But I wouldn't know because I wasn't there. As usual, anyway, my heart stopped, but my will, it wouldn't quit. Pretty sure that's why the League put me up here. Who'd want this moldering old kisser plastered all over kids' lunchboxes, huh? I'm so sorry, but I need your help. We have to go back. Hal looks at the broken treadmill. Oh boy, cosmic treadmill, time travel. All right. Hal begins to put the missing pieces together with his ring, and as soon as Barry gets on, he begins to run, and he smiles. See you soon, buddy. Deeper into the maze you go. As Barry enters the vortex, he begins to feel someone watching. Everything is wrong, like the speed force is resisting him, as though something didn't want him to see. Something obscene. Barry pushes through, adjusting himself to different frequencies over and over until he brute forces his way back into the past.
Barry skids into an alleyway as his body is burning and his suit is torn off. The Speed Force trying to yank him back, put him back where he belongs, but he continues anyway. He sees the moment that Wally fought Grodd and everything seems normal. Wally gets his shots in, Grodd gets his, but as Wally gets up to end it, Barry runs over to him to try and stop it. He doesn't see the monster, and even if there isn't a monster, even if this breaks the world, he has to keep Wally safe. He promised Iris, he promised Jay, he promised himself! He acts, but he fails all the same. The spear pierces Wally. I is that you, Barry? I, I was too slow. Did you see it? In the lightning? Barry reaches out, but the speed force begins to pull on him. He can't fight it as it drags him back, but as he re-enters the speed force, he can see it. He can see the monster and the lightning. Time after time, attempt after attempt, but each time, Flash's hand was just barely missing. Each time, Grodd plunged the Spear of Destiny into Kid Flash. And with every try, the effects of overexerting himself and the twisted nature of the Speed Force begins to take hold. It begins to transform the Flash into something else. After the last attempt, Flash forced himself to stop. He needed to come up with a new plan. When Iris saw the changes that were actually happening to him, she said he looked terrible. His face was a mess. She asked where was he. Flash told her that he was fixing things. And Iris shouts asking, Does it look like you fixed Wally? What we need now are doctors. Flash tells her no. No doctors. There's a friction in the speed force now because of that thing. Some sort of resistance and my body is compensating. Iris looks at his blistered skin telling him that he needs to stop. He just needs to stay here. Be with Wally before... You can't. But as Iris leaves, Barry's mother steps in, and he asks what is she doing here? She can't be here. Nora says that the nurse out at reception said that she could come right in. Flash tries to explain why Nora West being here is wrong, but he says, never mind. I'm just glad you can make it. She then says that the real question is, why is he still here? There's a way to make this right, and he's going to find it. Flash tells her that he tried, but she snaps at him, telling him to try harder, to go faster. Nothing is over until he says so. Understand? He stands up hugging her. Yes, ma'am. And she hugs him back. But Flash doesn't see who his mother really is, because in fact, it's insomnia steering this nightmare. Good boy. Now run. At that moment, it hits him. And he begins to think of it all backwards. He shouldn't be going back, he should be going forward. The only way that he can do what is needed is with the help of Hal Jordan. Flash skids into the watchtower, telling Hal that they need to try something. They're going to propel him forward in time, and he just needs a little more speed. Hal looks at the Flash and the changes that he's endured, this new monstrous Hulk-like body that he has. You can't. This has already had negative effects on you, hell. You're making me look good, Barry. The regret connects before the punch. Flash is moving too fast to pull the punch, and before Hal could even see it coming, he is hit so hard that his body bursts into pieces. The fleshy bits hit the ground with Hal asking, what the hell, man? And Flash tells him to pull himself together. He said it before he needs more speed, and he's going to help him get it. Moments later in the 25th century, Eobard Thawn is giving a tour of the Flash Museum, explaining the principles of Captain Cold's cold gun, when there's a loud crack-a-goom interrupting his lecture. In the other room, the Flash kneels down, picking up the Spear of Destiny as Eobard asks him, Is this what you came for, Barry? The weapon that killed the original kid Flash? Flash tells him that taking down Grodd with his own weapon, it'll have a pleasing symmetry to it. Eobard begins to put on the reverse Flash costume, that spear corrupts whoever wields it. We both know it, buddy. But seeing the way you look now, I'd say the damage to you is probably already done, you hulking monster. You should know that tinkering with the timeline never comes with good results. Now put back the spear and... But the Flash smiles. I'm not here for the spear. I'm here for your speed force. The two begin to move at such furious speeds, they exchange blow after blow until Eobard finally gains the upper hand, pinning Flash down. He reaches for the spear, asking, Why are you so broken? I would like to know why the fastest man alive misses everything! I'll tell you it's because... 
But before Eobard could finish, Flash vibrates his hand inside of Eobard's chest. Eobard drops the spear. What are you doing? You won't let that turn solid, so let's take a breath and... Flash tells him to look at him. What does it look like I'm capable of at this point? At that moment, Flash rips his arm out, leaving his hand inside of Eobard's chest, absorbing all of the speed force energy. He stands back up, walking over to the treadmill, and when he stops, he looks at his reflection. He stares, touching his face with his claw-like hand. What am I? But it isn't time to worry about those sorts of things. He decides he needs to run. With a spear in hand, Barry begins to run, and he runs so fast that he can feel his skin burning away, but he can't give up now. He travels back through time to the fateful moment that Grodd struck, and as he gets ready to prevent all of it, hands reach out, grabbing him. Flash struggles to try and free himself, yelling, No! I'm faster this time! How can they? He breaks away, stabbing at the monster in the Speed Force, hurting it enough to allow him to get ahead of it. And when he stops, he sees what it is. It can't be. He looks back at a mixture of limbs, bodies, faces of himself, begging him to fuse and lead them. It's a Barry Allen monster. No, I'm not like one of them. But the hands reach out once more and they begin to pull him into the fold. They begin to absorb him. The Flash screams, trying to fight free, but suddenly something calls out and he's pulled away. Two bodies tumble out of the speed force and Flash has a moment to realize who his rescuer is. Wally? Wally tells him that he has been running in some kind of sleep trance for hours. No one could reach him. Flash gets up grabbing Wally. You can't look at me, ever. But Wally asks, where is all of this coming from? They don't have time for it. Come on, Barry, shake it off. We're needed back in the fight. Flash looks at him, fight? What fight? And Wally looks him dead in the face. Oh, Barry, I really need to bring you up to speed. When the Nightmare Wave hit the world, some noticed it before they fell victim to its eternal sleep. Hal Jordan felt the effects coming while aboard a flight with Carol. But as he rushed to the cockpit and opened up the door, he found that he wasn't on the plane anymore. He looks around at all of the people in the funeral hall, and he asks, What's going on? And that's when he hears his name called. Hal turns and sees his mother. She looks younger and taller? The way she looked when... He was just a kid. And that's when it hits him. Hal is at the funeral for his father. The young Hal Jordan walks closer to the coffin, and then he notices something reaching out for him. A grim and twisted version of Hal's father beginning to crawl out, telling Hal to come close so that he can say goodbye to his dear old dad. Hal screams as he starts to run away, and his mother asks, where is he going? Doesn't he know that families never leave each other? She, along with everyone else, begins to transform into terrifying creatures like the one that he saw in the coffin. He then swings open the door, finding himself later in time testing a new flight trainer. One that Carol tells him he should have finished last month. He tells her, come on, you know I'm going to get it done. Hell, if I can get it finished by the weekend, then you need to promise me that you're going to spend time with me. She snaps it back, asking, how about you get this done this week and I promise not to fire you from the only place that will ever keep you employed? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll get to work right away. And then Hal sits in the cockpit, beginning to rev up and take off into the sky. He grabs the throttle, asking, how is it possible? It doesn't even have an engine. The giant metal tube shoots into the sky, then crash lands in the middle of the desert, almost killing Hal Jordan in the process. He takes a couple of deep breaths. I've got to be losing my mind. But then a voice calls out to him. He tells himself that he knows that he's losing his mind when he sees Abin Sir dying from his own crash, saying that he is in need of assistance. In order for him to help, Hal Jordan needs to put on the ring. He needs to find someone that can help him. Hal takes the ring, sliding it on his hand. I'm honored, but I'm no hero. Just as soon as the ring is on, a sharp pain courses through Hal Jordan's body, and Abin Sir tells him, Of course you're not. Hal struggles with the pain, begging to make it stop, but Abin Sir tells him, Of course it hurts. It's supposed to. Tendrils then begin to extend from the ring back to Abin Sir. I just needed someone weak. Someone the world would not miss, and it brought me you. While your life force is being drained, take some solace in knowing that your death was for a cause greater than your own. <laughs> 
Hal feels his body getting weaker and weaker by the second, but he knows that he must do something if he's going to survive this. He reaches for a piece of glass from the crash, and with one swipe, he cuts off his finger. What's this? You've still got some fight in you? You really do have a strong will. Hal tries reaching out next door, while Abin Sur creates a giant green sword and swings. Hal tumbles through the door, only to find himself standing before the Guardians. Ganthet tells him that he's been called here for a purpose, that his report on the events that have resulted in his fellow Korzman's death on Kuragar have presented the Guardians with much to think about. Hal says that he wants to take a team back to the planet so they can figure out how this person died. But Ganthet stops him. Your request is denied. What do you mean denied? A crime was committed here and it's our job to investigate. Yes, and you are no longer a part of the Green Lantern Corps. Not after the United Planets took control. You betrayed your oath and your friends. We've heard your concerns and... But Hal shakes his head. No, 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 this isn't right. This room, me, Kilowak. He turns his ring towards the Guardians, powering himself up. Who are you? The Guardians stare for a moment silently and then begin to smile. Don't you know? Admittedly, you have fared better than the others on your planet. Your reality has been shifted so many times to get the perfect fear. Hal begins to create construct soldiers, telling them to get back. An insomnia now appears, taking the form of the Guardians. Or what? What are you going to do? Hal charges forward this! He takes down the nightmare creatures that were once the Guardians, leaving only insomnia. There's one more fear, one more door for you. Hal turns back to the central battery, sensing something amiss. There's a hunger, there's a wanting, and what it wants is him. He calls out to the thing from the beyond. If you want me, come and get me! I'm right here! The dark voice looks at him. Yes, yes, right where you should be. And Parallax comes through the gateway. Welcome to your greatest nightmare! And Hal Jordan's nightmare will be continued next month in Night Terror's Green Lantern number two. But as a backup, we also get to see a little bit about Sinestro, the greatest Green Lantern slash villain. That's for you to decide. The world was put to sleep. It took out many of the world's greatest heroes, but at the same time, it took out one of the universe's greatest threats. In Coast City, a hooded Sinestro was wandering the streets feeling lost, broken so far gone that he was completely losing himself. He shuffles along the crowd when he suddenly bumps into someone and the man tells him to watch where he's going. Sinestro holds out his fist, how dare you? And then he notices his ring is missing. The man asks, what did you say? Sinestro looks at his ringless hand. I have no power, no fear. He tries to tell the man that he didn't say anything but the larger figure asks, what kind of a freak are you to talk to me like that? and he punches Sinestro. Sinestro thinks to himself that he once ruled planets, star systems, entire races, Quaint at the mere sound of his voice. He is the definition of power, of fear. But now he's nothing. Sinestro is afraid. At that moment, the purple light of the nightmare wave washes over and the world changes. Sinestro suddenly feels the weight of shackles around his arms and his legs. His surroundings completely alien, yet oddly familiar, twisted and warped, but somehow rooted in memory. The shame blends with the pain to create a potent, nostalgic cocktail of duties abandoned, friends turns foes. He does not need to know where he is to understand how he got here. He exuded power, killed without hesitation, ruled with impunity, and then it was gone. He was ashamed by how Pariah's dark army manipulated him, used him, and proved on him. He became a twisted, better version of himself, and now without his ring, he's not even himself. He's nothing. What kind of a man is Sinestro if he can't be the best version of himself? A hand reaches out to Sinestro, a voice asking if he's alright. Sinestro turns, asking the hooded man, Can you not see the madness all around? Surely you jest. The hooded man says that the time for jokes and jests are over, Sinestro. How do you know my name? And Abin Sir pulls down his hood. It can't be. It is I, and I have come at your weakest moment, just as you return home to Kuragar. Sinestro looks around at the long line of prisoners that he's with. Kuragar? No, that's not possible. Who is responsible for this treachery? Abin Sir looks at him. 
That is quite the question, one that will be soon answered, though I am shocked to see that you don't recognize yourself. The past version of Sinestra leans in smiling. Ah, my flawed self. A shell of the man I once was. But Sinestro then shouts, No! I will not fall prey to your trickery, not again. The past form asks, Trickery? That implies a ruse. When this is just your sad reality, how does it feel to be an objective failure? How often do you replay every moment, every decision, every wonder, and this is where things begin to fall apart? As the past self begins to change into a nightmare creature, Sinestro backs away, never! But the past version laughs. What a sad end to a miserable lantern! Suddenly the creature is filled with green light and it explodes and Sinestro looks up at the glowing figure asking, Are you Hal Jordan? The Green Lantern version of himself asks, Jordan? I've never heard of him. And as for you, you've certainly seen better days. Everything happened so fast and before Hal could react, Parallax was already attacking, telling him, This is your hell. Hal is knocked into the ground and as he gets up, I'm not afraid. Is that so? I can see into your mind, the ghosts of the past, the memories. Or maybe I should change my form into one you're more familiar with. Hal looks at the being. Who, what are you? And Parallax smiles as the evil version of Hal Jordan that once stood against the DC universe. I am your nightmares come to life. Your father's death. Worries that you wouldn't be the man that Abin Sur chose you to be. What happened to your friend on Karagar? And finally, the things you did when this alien took over your body. Most of your race carry their fears on the surface, but yours? They're buried much deeper than the rest. But I have found them. And now... Wait, why are you smiling? Hal stands back up with a grin ear to ear. Oh, buddy, you picked the wrong planet and the wrong person to try and scare. My friend Kilowog once told me, fear stood for false evidence appearing real. And those weren't fears that you found. They were moments when I was faced with a choice. To worry about what might happen next, or push the throttle forward. Parallax bears his fangs. You are nothing in this place. Beware my power. And Hal charges forward. That's my line. His ring begins to shine and Parallax is engulfed within the Green Lantern's light. Hal Jordan swings as hard as he could, knocking Parallax down. Parallax crashes into the ground, horribly injured already. What are you? I'm the Green Lantern, your worst nightmare. Parallax quickly scrambles to his feet, running through the doors into Hal's nightmares, the first being his encounter with Abin Sur. Hal follows behind him, and the evil Abin Sur is laughing at him. There you are. Now where were- But before he could finish, Hal slaps a metal mouthpiece over him. Yeah, you could stop talking. He then puts his fingers to his lips, shushing Abin Sir. I've heard enough from you. He creates a large hammer, winding it up and slamming it back down on the seesaw that he's placed Abin Sir on, launching Abin Sir into the air. As Hal flexes, he simply declares, Superman, eat your heart out and he realizes that Parallax is still attempting to escape and he begins to give chase. But as Hal catches up, Parallax turns yelling, Insomnia is calling to me, I have to go. But as he attacks, Hal effortlessly swats the yellow constructs aside. I am the master of your mind, I can still destroy you. But as more bigger and badder constructs appear, Hal tells him, no one but me is the master of my mind. That's what willpower is. However, there's another thing. We're in a dream world, right? If you can hurt me, that means that it works the other way around, too. Hal forms up a giant gun, blasting through the giant constructs and shooting straight in, hitting Parallax. Parallax retreats once more, now with a bullet wound, and Hal follows through the doorway. Where did you go? Come out! Let's get this over with. He looks at the shuffling bodies of his family, the corpses trying to blame him. Hey fam, you miss me? His father crawls forward, holding out his hand. Join us in death. You're not my dad. And you're making me fragging mad. A chainsaw appears on his hand, and Hal chops up his dad. Who's next? Aunt Lacey? I've always hated your birthday presents. 
He then takes a hold of the chainsaw with both hands, hacking away at the remaining bodies. And just as the last one appears behind him, he changes the chainsaw into a shotgun, turning back, opening fire. With nothing but bodies at his feet, another voice calls out. So typical Jordan of you, letting your family die, just like you let him die on Kuragar. But you don't like to talk about that, do you? Hal takes a deep breath. You can get out of my head now. Parallax steps out. Oh, did I strike a nerve? This isn't over. Hal pulls his arm back, winding up for the punch, and as he swings, his ring shines bright. And that's when he wakes up. It takes Hal a moment to realize what's going on, but he remembers that he fell asleep while in the air flying. He sees the pilot asleep and sits in the other chair. Yeah, this'll do. This'll do just fine. Let's touch this plane down and figure out what's going on. But the Green Lantern book also has a backup, the story of Sinestro dealing with his nightmares. Sinestro lands before the two halves of himself, one version of himself who was the beloved and respected hero, and the other a tyrannical monster. He could feel the fear bubbling inside, the shame. He has come face to face with the darkest evil, but this is someone's doing. Someone has infiltrated his reality to create these monstrosities. He will make them pay when he finds them. He will crack their skulls and laugh as they bleed to death. One half asks, what has he become? He used to serve the Guardians. He used to help people. He used to be a hero, but what now? The other asks him now. Your galaxy is away from that simpering man. You stood tall, a being of undisputed power, but this broken thing in front of me, a failure, a waste, nothing. Sinestro pushes back, asking, how dare you? You know nothing of me, what I've sacrificed. I have crushed men for less. I will enjoy ripping. The tyrant snatches him out of the air and slams him down. You will do nothing. You used to be a revolutionary, a merciless destroyer of worlds, but you are nothing more than a parody of yourself. Suddenly the righteous half yells out that that is enough. Some good remains in him, it must. No one can serve with such honor only to be a hapless nothing. The two nightmares begin to argue with each other, debating what Sinestro is. And Sinestro asks if there's any hope in any of this. Hope. What a strange alien word, a sensation he exiles from the far reaches of his mind. Could there ever be a path back to what he once was? And if there was a path back, would he take it? With attention off of him, Sinestro begins to slip away, but the righteous half grabs him, telling him that he cannot evade the truth. It is time for his reckoning, whether he likes it or not. Sinestro yells for them to go away, but soon they begin to change forms, first into Hal Jordan, and it asks, does he feel it in his heart, the people that he has failed, the people that he has betrayed? As the form changes once more into Sornik, his daughter, the righteous tells him that there is still hope, but only if he wants it. Sinestro tells the two halves to leave him be. And then another voice calls out, a familiar yet strange yet different voice, the voice calls out to guide him, and as Sinestro follows the sound, he sees his daughter Sornik once more, asking for her help. The vision of the Green Lantern version of his daughter soon shifts into one powered by fear. A yellow lantern Sornik, and she tells him, Help, you have made a grave mistake. I've come to bury you. But then everything disappears, and Sinestro awakens. Even though he's awake, the question remains in his mind, what has he become? It doesn't deserve to be unanswered for long. The doubt, the fear, the shame. It's gone now. He's been through his own personal hell and he isn't afraid anymore. He knows who he is, who he's always been, and it's time to let the world know who Sinestro, the Yellow Lantern, really is. As the world sleeps, there's a storm over Gotham as the forces of good and evil continue to battle their endless war. Batman tells the Joker that he'll never win, and the Joker laughs. Oh, Batman, my dearest friend, don't you know that nobody wins at these? The fun is playing the game. Batman reaches out, and as he lunges for Joker, he slips, falling face first on the metal roofing. The Joker bursts out laughing. <laughs> that looked like it hurt. You might want to consider getting some shoes with better traction. But Batman doesn't move, and his body continues to slide down the wet roof. You're gonna get up, right, Batman? Lightning strikes, 
as the lifeless body falls over the edge. Do they make the roof more slippery or something? And Gaggy the Clown tells him, no, it's just the rain. Maybe? The body lands with a loud crunch, and the Joker looks over, stating that they should probably check on him. Otherwise, they're just standing around on a roof like a bunch of clowns. As the three of them get down, they see Batman has yet to move. Maybe he's just uh, unconscious, the Joker asks. They turn Batman's mangled body over, and the Joker realizes, okay, he's not unconscious. What are we supposed to do now? Did we just kill Batman? We should uh, probably leave and throw the body in the trunk. I I'll think of something. At the local diner, the Joker sits beside the dead Batman playing with his food when Gaggy says, uh, maybe we should kill Superman next. Joker looks up. And how are we supposed to kill Superman? Do you expect him to just fall off a roof and die like a freaking moron? Gaggy chimes in. Well, we should do something. How about we plan something a bit more fun? Two days later, aboard a large transport ship, Joker and his henchmen dress as pirates as the crew is taken hostage. Joker asks the captain, What exactly are you transporting here? The captain tells him, Unrefined uranium ore. Where is it? It's in the hold, but there's no security protecting it. Really? We can just take the uranium ore? Yes, there's nothing stopping. The Joker sighs, stabbing the captain. Tell the goons to get the plutonium. Uranium? Ah, who cares? I guess we'll make a bomb or something. A few days later, the bored and unkept Joker is eating his breakfast as Gaggy asks, Do we have any plans today? Joker sighs. I was thinking about watching the real Housewives of Metropolis. You finished that yesterday. I guess I'll start a rewatch. Gaggy holds up a newspaper with the headline, Crime Wave Hits Gotham, Where Is Batman? Look, we did it! And everyone else is getting rich while we do nothing! This is what you've worked for your whole life, Joker! What am I supposed to do now? All I want to do is watch Real Housewives. Gaggy gets up throwing the paper. This isn't what I signed up for! I could be henching for Mad Hatter right now! As the papers fall, one lands on Joker's lap, titled, Jobs. The next day, John D, who is insomnia inside of Joker's nightmare, sits at his desk at Wayne Enterprises. Our fear of influence touches every living soul on the planet. It's tireless work, but it's worth it. We work while the world sleeps, is what I like to say. Full disclosure, the man who had your position before, Mr. Armstrong, was arrested for his role in the hijacking of a boat. You may have heard about that. And that's why we're in a rush to fill the position. And you seem like the right man. The Joker, using the false name Johan Kaiser, fixes his suit and glasses. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. D. I can't wait to join the team. It feels like this will give me a real sense of purpose in my life, something that I feel has been missing for quite some time. Joker then takes a seat inside of his cubicle, and the first thing that he tries to look up is, where is all the money? But he gets an invalid data request. Next, he tries looking up secret weapons projects, but that is also denied. At that moment, a voice calls out, caught you, and the Joker panics, but a woman peers around the corner. Sorry that I startled you. My name's Helen, and I just wanted to introduce myself. Make sure you're getting settled in, okay? I think my computer's broken. I can't access the money or the secret files. I need to access weapons, blueprints, or lists of people that I can bribe. Helen stares for a moment and begins to laugh. I'm not sure what's so funny about that. Helen wipes a tear away. You're making a joke about David Armstrong, right? Anyway, we should hurry. We don't want to be late for the meeting. Joker heads off to his first cubicle blue collar meeting a few mundane weeks later joker is pouring himself a coffee telling the others in the break room that he used to work in a calendar factory they tried to fire him for taking a day off also he kidnapped the boss's wife but as he gets no responses his boss mr goodman steps in asking everyone if he could have a moment with their newest employee as everyone clears out joker asks is everything all right mr goodman it wasn't my joke was it Goodman tells him, no, it's not his jokes. Everyone enjoys them. What he wanted to talk about was his performance. 
Looking over his end of month reports, they don't really look like reports. They're just lines scribbled on pieces of paper. One image of one of them appears to be a man being deflowered by a dog or maybe a boar, and the man is labeled with his name, Mr. Goodman. Joker flips through the papers. Ah, uh, really? I, I don't see that here. Strange. But before he could finish, Goodman takes the papers back asking, What are you even doing here? Because this work shows no indication that you have any idea how to even use... But before he could finish, Joker grabs the microwave, bashing it over Goodman's head, turning it on. You ask way too many questions! The microwave fries Goodman's head, and Joker steps out as Helen runs over asking if everything's okay. She heard a loud noise. Yes, yes, everything's fine. I uh, left something in the oven. I'm going to take the rest of the day off. So the next day, the Joker is standing on his desk, calling out to anyone who will listen. You're all cogs in the machine that seeks to destroy us. We're bootlickers to a capitalist state that seeks to exert control over us. You do nothing. You serve no purpose. But Mr. D, once again, insomnia, walks up asking, Can I see you for a moment? Joker looks at Mr. D. I'm sort of in the middle of something. Yes, of course. When you're finished then, Mr. Kaiser. So Joker goes back to his monologue. Your own families won't even mourn your deaths. After a few more moments of silence, Mr. D asks, Is that it? Yeah, yeah, I I'm done, Mr. D. Let's talk. Mr. D brings Joker into his office, and he says that he might have heard about Mr. Goodman by now. He died yesterday. He was in an accident in the break room. Hit his head and, well, he's going to have the forever sleep now. Joker reaches into his trench coat, pulling out a gas mask. You do say? Yeah. It's quite possible he took his own life. The Joker stops, just shy of activating the gas strapped to him. Wait, what? Mr. D turns back with two glasses, and he laughs. What they told me really is true. Mr. Kaiser, you really are a jokester. But let's be serious for a moment. You're a rising star. Bruce Wayne has even taken a shine to you. With Goodman dead, I need someone who isn't afraid to dedicate his whole life to the job. I would like to promote you to Regional Management Assistant Vice Supervisor. Uh, are you sure? Sure as I've ever been, Mr. Kaiser. Between the arrests and the deaths, if we don't turn this ship around, Batman himself is going to pay us a visit here on the ninth floor. Uh, yeah, you see, the problem with that is Batman is dead. <laughs> you crack me up, Mr. Kaiser. A few more weeks pass, and Joker is presenting the month's quarterly reports, telling everyone that he isn't sure if someone forgot a decimal or a multiplier. But this is bad. The last time I saw something this ugly is when they pulled Mr. Goodman's head out of the microwave. Everyone stares for a moment, and then they begin to laugh. All right, everyone, that's enough. Go home. We're done for the day here. One of the girls stops before leaving, asking, You know, a few of us are going out for drinks. It's Randy D'Amico and Shipping's birthday. Maybe you'd like to come? So a few hours later, the Joker is yelling. Who's having another with me? Anyone, anyone, who's gonna drink with me? Helen? Helen! Drink with your boss, Helen! Helen! But everyone quietly and awkwardly clears out of the bar with the Joker scoffing. If you didn't want to drink with me, that's fine anyway. I was gonna poison them all! When the Joker leaves, he notices a couple of men following him and he begins to run down an alleyway. As soon as he turns the corner, he's cracked in the head with a bat, and the group of men begin to kick the crap out of him. You've all just made a very big decision in your lives. Very big! <laughs> See what I mean? He gouges out the eyes of one man with his thumbs, and then he turns, shouting, Gotham is my town! You're all just bloody tourists. You have no idea who you just crossed paths with. But out of the shadows, Gaggy steps out. Is... is that you? Joker smiles with his bloody face. Oh, hello, Gaggy! Looks like you've branched out into more pathetic ventures. We didn't know what happened to you. We looked everywhere for you, boss. The rumors are that Batman is back. We were worried that he came for you. Joker dusts himself off, telling Gaggy, Stop making up lies. It's unbecoming of a man of your stature. Well, how have you been? Setting up your next big score? No. Joker then walks off. You should find something that gives you purpose. You can't sit around waiting all day for a man in a bat costume to assault you. What kind of life is that? So the next morning, the Joker heads into work, all bandaged up, telling everyone that they should have stuck around for karaoke. His tears of the clown would have given them chills. He also does some Fleetwood, but Helen stops him asking, What the hell happened? Oh, what, this? You should see the other guy. I gorged his eyes out with these babies. 
A few of the workers laugh, but one of them says that crime is really getting out of control. Where is Batman when they need him? Oh, Batman's corpse is in my closet at home! But another worker chimes in stating that his wife was mugged last week by the reservoir. Thankfully, she's okay and Batman even got her purse back. Joker spits out his coffee. What? Y yeah Is she sure that it was Batman? Yeah, there's not a lot of other guys dressed up like a giant bat last time I checked. So on his walk home, Joker looks in the sky and notices the bat signal, and he begins to grind his teeth. As he heads into the apartment building, old man Jarvis walks out with his dog. How's work, Ben? Uh, you know, just another day working for the man. Joker sighs as he goes inside, and he takes off his coat, shooing away the flies. He hangs it up, turning on the TV. The news anchor begins to report the week in business. They go on explaining that Wayne Enterprises is facing huge penalties with the IRS for misreporting their quarterly expenses. Bruce Wayne himself issued a statement stating that he was embarrassed by the report and would personally like to get to the bottom of how it happened. Joker grabs a drink. Good. Go get him, Bruce. Porter goes on stating that in city news, Batman broke up a major jewel heist the previous night. The police state that this is the fifth major burglary that Batman has stopped this month. But while the Joker is watching this, with his closet wide open behind him, Batman's rotting corpse is hanging there. Joker kicks his feet up, grabbing the remote. What channel is the Real Housewives on again? The corporate life was working for Joker. He had a steady job, legitimate income, and most of all, purpose. Except, it wasn't a real purpose, it was a fake purpose. He didn't have a purpose without Batman around, and worried about Batman being dead was beginning to spread. So Joker did what no one thought possible. He became the Batman, but a very brutal, violent, murderous Batman. At least, that's what he thought until he woke up. He woke up gasping from this dream that he had become Batman, and his wife, Lena, asked if he had another bad dream. Joker looks at her. What? Oh, maybe. Did I wake you, sweetie? Before she could answer, his son, Albert, comes into the bedroom asking, What are you doing sleeping still? I'll be late to practice. Joker gets out of bed, telling him it'll be okay. We won't be late. So how about some of Papa's famous clown pancakes before we leave? Yes, life was going quite swimmingly for the Joker. He was even rising in the ranks at work, becoming a hiring manager and hiring all of Gotham's old villains who were trying to lay low while they figure out if the rumors of Batman's return are true. Of course, that can't be true because Batman's dead corpse is sitting in the closet of the Joker's house. So obviously the villains are the crazy ones. Or are they? Maybe the Joker is the crazy one. His dreams of becoming Batman, they feel so real. For example, last night, he went on patrol stopping a mugging by none other than his former henchman, Gaggy. First, Joker made some quips while killing the two lackeys. Then it was Gaggy's turn. Gaggy tried to reason with the Joker. He told him that they used to work together, but the Joker took Gaggy's back. I work alone. Is this a joke, boss? This a new gig you been doing? We heard you went straight. Joker winds the bat up. No, I heard that you're going straight to. And as that bat cracks, we cut to a different time period in the Joker's life. He hits a baseball that goes flying into the air and the Joker makes a break for first. Bruce Wayne is calling out from the dugout. Go for two, go for two. Joker slides in as the umpire yells, safe. And the second baseman tells him that it was a nice hit. Mr. Luther was striking everyone out, but he's the only one who got the bat on the ball. They should call him Bat Man. Joker looks at him. What did you say? You know, because it's baseball, Batman. It's just a joke. Don't you like jokes? Joker begins to strangle the man. I love jokes. <laughs> Lex Luthor yells to Bruce, telling him to get his man off the field. Bruce reels him back in. You did good out there. We should have dinner. My place. Any food allergies? Uh, just shellfish. And Bruce tells him perfect. Later that night, Joker arrives at Wayne Manor, where John D, aka Insomnia, or rather, the role of Winchester, Bruce's butler, greets him at the door. I'm terribly sorry, but Mr. Wayne is not here. He was called away on urgent business and he won't be back for a few days. But Bruce walks up wearing his trademark Hawaiian shirt and purple hat. He 
begins to laugh. <laughs> of course I'm here, Windham. Have you been drinking again? Johan, so glad you can make it. The Joker comes in under his alias, Johan, telling him that he hopes that it isn't about the baseball game. What? No, have a seat, Johan. He walks to the other end of the comically long dining table. Bruce says that Winthorpe here has cooked them a lovely meal, an appetizer of oysters, followed by delicious lobster bisque, and then the main course of black pepper crab. Joker scoffs. I hope you don't mind the anaphylactic shock. Oh, that's going to be perfect. If this isn't about the baseball game, why do you have me here? It's because you've been doing great work and I feel that something is off. Like you're not your normal self, the one that we hired so long ago. Well, legal said that I couldn't joke around as much with all of the lawsuits still pending. Bruce begins to shovel food into his mouth. We need spirit in this world. We need people to be a little crazy. A man without a sense of humor is like Gotham without Batman. Joker yawns. <sighs> I thought Batman died, but apparently people keep seeing him. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. You're so funny, Johan. If Batman ever died, people would lose their minds. Everything would be so boring. Maybe that's what's wrong with you. Batman died and part of you died with him. Without Batman, you're broken. But this imposter is awakening something. But then Bruce bursts out laughing. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We all know that Batman is fine, watching over us all. So whatever seems wrong with you, you must simply be imagining it. Maybe this is all a dream. Winchester leads it whispering. You'll have to excuse the sir. He has a shellfish allergy that makes him act erratically. Stop whispering about me, Wilson! Joker blinks again when his name is called. And then he looks around. Where am I? And one of the board members at the meeting that he forgot he was at is telling him about the new expense reports and he just spaced out like a nut job. Nut job? Very funny, I'm very funny. Here's a joke for you. Joker begins to stab the board member with a pencil. I'm gonna tear your head off and use your throat like a toilet. Then they're gonna stitch your stupid head back on and bring your body to your daughter's birthday next week as a diarrhea pinata. But Mr. D walks in the room and the Joker looks back. Oh, you hadn't told me that you'd be at the meeting. He stabs the body one more time and then pushes it onto the table as Mr. D looks at him. I just wanted to tell everyone. We're closing up shop early today so the building can get fumigated. But I'd like a word. Is everything okay, Johan? Joker straightens his jacket. No, Bruce Wayne told me something at dinner and has been bothering me, but it's nothing. I'm just being silly. Mr. D tells him that HR warned him about being silly, but keep in mind, Bruce loves to play tricks. He likes to get into our heads. You know how trillionaires are. The important thing is to remember how much you love your job. Joker heads home for the day and when he enters his home, his worst fears come to life as he sees his son, Albert has discovered Batman's body in the closet. He quickly begins to stuff the rotting corpse back in. Don't you ever go in there again! You know the rules! Why aren't you in school? It's nighttime and I'm sick! Why is Batman's dead body in there? Joker slams the door. You have a, you have a crazy imagination, Gaggy! Look, I really don't need this right now. Just go to bed, Gaggy, okay? <laughs> As Albert leaves, Lena asks what's wrong and Joker tells her nothing. Just Bruce Wayne getting in my head is all, making me think something is wrong with me and I took it out on the boy. What's in the closet, dear? Lena asks and Joker walks over. Nothing, there's nothing wrong with me. To prove it, Joker goes out telling everyone as he walks by. There's nothing wrong with me. I tried to tell you all that Batman was dead, but now there's a fake one running around. Does that even make sense? Joker pleads his case to the man at the urinal. And the man asks, can you just stop looking at me? So Joker grabs him. I need to prove it. I'll prove that Batman's alive. All I have to do is catch him. He hurries to the hardware store, breaking and grabbing several items and recreating his toxin before hiring some men to pretend to rob somebody. He gives the men the toxin hiding while they get to work. And just as they begin to rob someone, Batman appears, except it's still the Joker in the Batman outfit. He punches the hired goons, cracking a few jokes. The face paint begins to stick to his hand. What the hell is this? It's too sticky. Get away. The goon grabs the toxin and the Joker yells, wait, kill them all. The goon cracks it. I was told that he'd say that. Joker begins to inhale the gas. You can't do this. You can't kill Batman. We need Batman. <laughs> 
<laughs> and the Joker then wakes up in the old abandoned warehouse where some of Gotham's other villains are sitting. I just had the strangest dream. Solomon Grundy looks at him. It's okay. You with friends now. And Joker sighs, laying back down. Shut up! I'm going back to sleep. Everything was a haze as Nightwing begins to come too. He starts to hear voices. He tries moving his arms and his legs and he finds himself strapped down. He begins to ask, what is going on? The nurse tells him that he's starting to come around. Should we give him more of a painkiller? The second nurse tells him no. The pain will provide him with some clarity. A clear head is paramount to his recovery. Nightwing finds himself wheeled down the hallway, trying to take in what he can to detect that this place is familiar because it looks like he is in Arkham Asylum. The nurse continues to talk, stating that he's still a bit groggy from the sedatives. They'll wear off soon enough, but then he'll remember. He'll remember. The next time Nightwing snaps too, he's being hosed down by some security guards as they laugh at him, panicking. Oh, it looks like the killer can't even handle a little bit of water. Loosen up, boy. Enjoy your spa day. Once they're done, the guards throw him his clothes. Nightwing tries to process what this even is, how he even got here, and why does he hurt so much. After getting dressed, Nightwing is then handcuffed, and he walks down the hall to his cell, where many of the criminals he helped put away welcome him with open arms. But something's off. They're not all yelling at him with claims that they'll get their revenge. They're talking to him like he's one of them. The guards toss Nightwing into his cell, telling him to go on and get settled. If he doesn't want any problems, he better make nice with his celly. Nightwing looks around at the one-bed cell. Celly? Wait, there's been a mistake. Someone explain to me what's going on! He bangs on the cell door, and Two-Face is flipping a coin. What is out? Everyone knows about you and what you did. Sure, out there you're a monster, but in here... You're an icon, kid. Nightwing tells him, Whatever you think I've done, I didn't. You must not remember it then. Don't worry, the drugs should last you long enough, especially with that guy in your cell. Nightwing looks back again. Who? There's no one else here! Getting nowhere, Nightwing lays down to try and let the sedatives and the drug work through his system, trying to piece together what actually happened. When a voice whispers to him to try and get some rest. Perhaps, once he wakes up, it'll all have been a nightmare. Nightwing begins to drift off to sleep, beginning to see pieces of something. A vision. The past. Whatever it is, it's violent and there's blood on his hands. But before he could look down to see who he was hitting, the police arrive. They yell for him to put his hands up to where they can see them. Nightwing begins to run. It wasn't me! You have the wrong guy! But the animal police charge at him, asking, Then whose blood's all over your sticks then? Give it up already! We got you cornered! Nightwing runs into a dead end, turning back. I'm just gonna have to go through them to get out of here. The police are hardly a problem, especially when he tries. But no matter how skilled he is at fighting, a stun gun to the back can put down just about anyone. One of the officers scoffs that it's one more murderous animal for the funny farm. Nightwing tells him to stop. I I'm not. Who do you think I killed? At that moment, Nightwing snaps to reality. He wakes up. He's being electrocuted awake and one of the rat doctors says that he's regaining consciousness. Should they administer more anesthesia? And a voice over the comm says no. Let him wake up. The pain will be good for him. The rat nurse readies a syringe stating that if he survives the procedure, of course. The voice goes on stating that death has curative properties as well. Remove the mouthpiece. I'm curious if our guest has begun to remember. As the mouthpiece is removed, a voice says, Welcome back to the land of the living. Do you remember what you did? How you got here? Nightwing forces a smile. Yeah, ask your mom what I did. With that, Nightwing is electrocuted again. Dig deep, recall your deeds. Nightwing screams, struggling in his chair until he rips apart the leather straps beginning to stand back up. The doctor tells him, Please, remain calm. The treatments may hurt, but we will cure you in the long run. Treatment? You're going to kill me! Please restrain the patient! Use whatever force is necessary! The guards run in. Use force. 
Got it, Nightwing says, throwing the table at the guards. He then turns it back to the doctor and the nurse, and the doctor tells him, Please, wait, we're just doing our jobs. We want to help. Nightwing lifts another table, ready to hit them. We're way past that now. And then he suddenly loses his strength, falling to his knees. You put something in my mind. Stay away. I won't hurt you if you let me go. The doctor and the nurse soon begin to tell him, Wait, it's us. It's been so long. No wonder you don't recognize. The two take off their rat heads, and Nightwing stares. No, no, this can't be, this isn't real. The corpses of John and Mary Grayson look back, and the voice asks, Don't they look familiar? Mom and Dad, their hopes for you flew so high. Too bad you were destined to fall, just like your parents. The bodies begin to wither away, and Nightwing goes on. I've had nightmares like this before but they were never this vivid. Have you now? Maybe you're just a lost cause after all. Nightwing looks at the one-way mirror in front of him and he jumps through it, shattering the glass, and there stands Insomnia. Nightwing readies himself for the fight, telling him, nothing I see or hear can be trusted. I'm being betrayed by my own memories, my own mind. It's too real to be a dream, and yet. But Insomnia beats down Nightwing, and he wakes back up in his cell, as the voice from before tells him. So you're awake. Nightwing grabs his head. Ugh, awake, asleep, how can I tell the difference anymore? That's easy, because you stopped snoring. Nightwing looks around. Who's there? It's just me, I've been here the whole time. Nightwing jumps up and down, looking under his own bed. Why don't you just come out? I'm quite content remaining here, thank you. Getting frustrated, Nightwing flips the bed over to find Nothing. The voice tells him that it happens to the best of us. It's okay to be afraid. The mind is a scary place. We must accept the reality of the multiverse, yet still we dismiss our own internal worlds, the dimensions inside of our brains. Nightwing looks around again, listening to where the voice is coming from, and then he looks over at the sheet, beginning to rip them apart. Once the shredded linen falls to the ground, Nightwing looks again, and a paper-thin Jonathan Crane stands there. Surprise, it's me, your old pal Scarecrow. I should have seen it sooner. This is all you're doing. How'd you do it, Scarecrow? A new strain of fear gas? Sorry, but I'm fresh out. If I'm good, they might give me my stash back on discharge. See, I'm nearly ready to return to the outside world, but you... <laughs> It's going to be a long road. We all know what you did, and we're all impressed. Suddenly, it sinks in. Flashbacks beginning to inform him of what happened. Barbara was there asking, What did you do? What did you do, Dick? And Nightwing begins to realize what happened. He begins to cycle the thoughts through his mind. No, no, it wasn't me. He slams his fist on the ground as Scarecrow tells him, Denying it won't change the truth! You killed Batman! Two-Face begins to laugh maniacally. <laughs> you succeeded where we all failed, kid. A bit irritating, really. Nightwing gets it back up. No, no, this is all in my head! Sure, because you already knew that you'd done it. You tucked the memories away, but they stick around. Out of sight isn't out of mind. Nightwing begins to look around. I, I need to get out of here. I have to prove I didn't do it. A scarecrow grabs him. I was hoping you'd say that because I have a plan. I've made a map of the building, but the building has a nasty habit of changing when you're not looking, making cartography difficult. We're currently here, or maybe there, or we could be over there. As scarecrow begins to go over his map, Nightwing tells him to be quiet because he can hear the guards coming. He hurries over and he can hear two guards dragging someone, and one of them complaining that they can't drag her on his own. She's like 90% metal at this point. Nightwing looks through the food slot to try and figure out who's being brought in, and when he sees who, he yells out, Put her down! Babs, tell me you're okay! Babs! But a metal-infused Barbara looks up, being dragged down the hallway. I've killed my father, and now they have the woman that I love. I don't give a damn if this is real. I'm gonna tear this whole place apart, even if it means destroying my own mind in the process. As the guards drag her away, Nightwing calls out to Barbara that he'll think of something that will get them out of here. Just, just hang on a bit longer, Babs. 
The guards snap back at him, telling him to keep it down or he'll find himself in re-education soon. Nightwing groans in frustration. The realization that he killed a Batman and then seeing his girlfriend being dragged in is too much for him. Scarecrow looms over. You can scream all you like, but nothing will happen. You should have seen what they did to What's-Her-Face, Black Canary. Nightwing spins back, grabbing Scarecrow. That's enough! Where's that map you drew? Scarecrow pulls out a piece of paper, right here. And just as I thought, it's a whole new design. Nightwing begins to unfold it. Buildings can't just change their layouts. He looks down at the completely new and insane design, complete with Scarecrow and Nightwing holding hands in the bottom corner. This makes no sense. This is a nightmare. Scarecrow leans in. No, it's more like a nightmare within a nightmare, right? Glad you're finally starting to get it. At that moment, the cell door swings open and Nightwing gets ready to fight. All right, who wants some? Nobody. It's chow time. Hopefully you've got an appetite. Today is Meatball Monday, Scarecrow says to him. However, as Nightwing begins to walk out, he looks around and sees that no one is there. All right, what's up with this? Everyone is already in the mess hall. Because we're on the naughty list, we're called last. The warden has a penchant for drama. Perhaps he wanted to give you a grand entrance. It's not every day the person who killed Batman eats here. As the doors open, Nightwing looks at all of the villains that he put in there, all in their twisted nightmare version glory. And in the back, Barbara grabs her tray of motor oil and batteries, getting ready to sit down when Nightwing runs over. What happened to you? We have to get you out of here now, Babs. She sighs. I got you too. You need to escape before they do the same thing. System buffering, 17%, please wait. As Barbara stares off, buffering her systems, her wires reach out, grabbing Killer Croc's arm, and he hisses, What the hell is this? Then up from above, a voice calls out that she warned them before about any of this. One more outburst and you'll regret it! Nightwing looks up to see that Harley Quinn is now the head guard. God, this kind of crap always happens when the kitchen serves meatballs. Before Nightwing could even ask what she's doing here, she sends out her hyenas, telling them, Take Croc down! Scarecrow then pushes Nightwing away. We gotta get out of here. I am not leaving Babs. As the riot begins to break out, Nightwing and Scarecrow hide behind one of the tables when suddenly, baby-faced Grundy punches a guard, launching him across the room. The body slams into the wall, falling right before them. And Nightwing notices a set of keys on him. While everyone continues brawling and hitting whatever is in front of them, Nightwing and Scarecrow sneak off to try and look for Barbara. And when they get to the next room, everything changes. Nightwing pulls out the map. All right, what is this place? It's not on the map. That's because it's not on the map. This area is uncharted. It's the back rooms of Arkham. I once worked with this fellow, Basil Grimes. Said he was an architect. Never saw a resume, but he seemed legit. If you were gonna map the building, Grimes would be your best bet, Nightwing. We did have a pair of walkie-talkies, but he's been missing for a few days now. Hopefully he's alive! Just then the walkie-talkie buzzes and Scarecrow pulls it out as Basil asks, Anyone there? Professor Crane. Scarecrow responds, I read you! What the hell happened out here? I may have taken a wrong turn. Not to worry, we're coming to find you, Basil. Basil pauses. We? He's with you, isn't he? The bad boy with the nice... But Nightwing interrupts. I can hear you. I left your trail for you. Just follow it for a bit and you should be able to find me. The two spot the blood marks in the back rooms and Basil says, Oh, I forgot to mention, Oracle found her way into my radio frequency. She said to pass along a message. Find a way out and save yourself. Sounds like she really likes you, Bat Boy. She knows I can't leave her. So Basil asks, Are you going against her wishes just to satisfy your ego? Typical. Oh well, you should be coming up on me now. As they turn the next corner, Scarecrow looks down at the melted body of Basil Grimes. Oh, look at you! You're naked! Nightwing examines the body, stating that Basil is at an advanced state of decay. And this putrefaction. How long have you been gone? Oh, he's only been gone for like three days! Scarecrow tells him. Basil leans up, grabbing Nightwing, telling him, People change here. It happened to Oracle. She knew that you would be next, but you're going to escape, right? Live happily ever after. 
But how do you leave a place with no way in? Think about it. How did you get here? The story that you killed Batman. What about before? Any outstanding sins to atone for? Heard you made a few mistakes. Nightwing pulls his arm back. I've paid for those, and now it's my turn to... But at that moment, Barbara radios in, telling him to leave Basil alone. The poor man is already dead. Hurry to the next room and he'll find her. They don't have much time before he turns into a nightmare as well. Nightwing rushes past, opening the door to find Barbara hooked up to a machine, speaking to herself as she rattles off error messages and codes. Scarecrow takes a closer look. Oh, it appears she has a bug right there. See, it's right next to her heart. Nightwing reaches out, plucking the bug out. I've got you. I've always got you, Babs. She reboots, falling out. This is, this is a nightmare. I know. No, Nightwing, this is a literal nightmare. We are stuck in a literal nightmare. I've run enough simulations to recognize their hallmarks, and we are in one. Whatever this is, it's turning us into what we fear the most. An oracle here, she's afraid of being too reliant on computers. Well, I'm afraid of... Well, everything! It dilutes the effect. If anything, we should probably be most afraid of what Nightwing's fears are. At that moment, a spotlight begins to turn on and Insomnia shouts, Welcome one! Welcome all to the most magnificent show on Earth! Tonight's act features the high, flying chills and all the spills we pray to never see. Soon the room begins to shift and everyone finds themselves standing in the middle of the circus ring as Insomnia goes on stating, there are some who tame lions, some who charm snakes, and others who train bears. But tonight, all eyes are upon the bat. Batman, half dead, begins to shuffle in, and he begins to run towards Nightwing for murdering him. Nightwing jumps out of the way. None of this is real. I didn't kill you. I'm not. But Batman can't help himself, shouting, Murderer, witchcraft, wit, traitorous gifts, shameful lust. But this time, as Batman lunges, Nightwing grabs him by the arm, and his arm just falls off. Nightwing stares at his clawed hand. What's happening to me? Vile, lonesome cross, <laughs> Batman says, laughing at him. Barbara throws her wiring out, grabbing a hold of Batman, calling out to Nightwing, You're not a monster, even if you're turning into one. Nightwing begins to run forward, jumping with both feet forward, kicking a giant hole into zombie Batman's chest. Insomnia laughs. Ha <laughs> the crowd to behold. The elegance and power of a flying Grayson. Come on up. Take your place in the spotlight. Make your parents proud. Nightwing climbs up to the high flying location. And he sees Insomnia's face change to that of Tony Zuko, the man that changed his life forever. Naturally, his face still haunts you. Maybe we should turn the heat up. What do you say, Nightwing? Nightwing grits his teeth, launching forward. I think it's time that you had something to fear. This is no longer my nightmare. It's yours, Insomnia. He twists and snaps Insomnia's neck, falling to the ground and looking back up. As if my fears would be so pedestrian. Nightwing hangs off the top rope as Scarecrow yells that he can jump. Don't worry, I'll catch you. And as Nightwing lands, he asks, where is Babs? And Scarecrow tells him, you know, a simple thank you would have sufficed. But Oracle has everything under control. Nightwing hurries over, calling out to Barbara, and she stands with Cassandra Kane and Stephanie Brown, stating that she's okay and she got the Batgirls. They've all managed to break themselves out of this nightmare. But at that moment, a light begins to shine on Nightwing and Barbara yells to watch out. Wires fly past grabbing Batman, but this time she electrocutes him until his body disappears and transforms into literal bats. The bats begin to swirl and fly up through a hole. As Stephanie says that that might be their ticket out. Nightwing tells them to go and Barbara stops. You always do this. But Nightwing tells her that she should know that he'll be fine. He has something that he has to do first. As the circus tent begins to burn, Nightwing walks back and Scarecrow looks at him, telling him, Oh, you came back for me. How sweet. Nightwing reaches out, telling him that the plan was to escape together. Despite everything that he has done in the past, there's no way that he'd leave without Scarecrow. Scarecrow laughs. In a different world, we may have been friends, but alas, Nightwing. Nightwing tells him to take his hand and Scarecrow just stands there. How does this end? 
You're gonna carry me to safety tonight, but what happens tomorrow? Better leave while we're on speaking terms. Go. Save yourself. There's a moment of hesitation, but Nightwing turns back. I won't forget what happened here. And Scarecrow smiles. I know. The best part of you liked it. That time you got to kill Daddy. Darkness is a part of you. The thin margin between dread and desire. Tonight you tasted it, and it left you wanting more. Nightwing begins to wake up, and Scarecrow laughs. laughs. Now that we're alone, I need to know. What did you have for me? Please, Insomnia, I have been a patient. The crows begin to fly over, and one lands on a Scarecrow's arm. Did you do this all for me, Insomnia? Made a place where I can indulge. Well, it was beautiful. <laughs> Nightwing then begins to wake up, telling himself that it was a bad dream. It's something that he's going to be thinking about for a long time to come. Crime never stops in Gotham. Certainly not before the world event that could put the unknowing inhabitants to sleep. For Tim Drake, he continues to put himself to the absolute limits by not resting night after night on his patrols and arrests. Where across town, another Bat family member finds himself in a similar position, though Jason Todd would never admit it. But for these two, they're about to get some much-deserved sleep, just not in the way that they'd want. As the nightmare wave covers the world, these two Robins are easily taken by its mists, but they somehow manage to find themselves within the same dream. Jason rubs his head, asking, Tim, what are you doing here? I told Oracle I didn't need any backup. And Tim begins to get up and look around. I'm not sure where you were before the energy wave, but I wasn't in some twisted joke of Gotham. Jason then takes in the floating buildings and giant tentacles. All right, point taken. So are we in some alternate universe or something? I don't think so. It feels like I'm in the seediest part of Gotham, but also on my way to class in 10th grade. The morphing landscape, the strange logic, the mental leaps. It's quite possible that we're both dreaming. Funny that you mention that. I get the strangest feeling that I know that it's my 53rd birthday and that we're being watched. But if this is a dream, how do I know that you're real? Let's test it. Jason punches Tim with enough force to knock him back. Hey, what was that for? I did it in the last dream that I had with you. Except this time, you turned into a bunch of little cartoon birds. Tim then spits out all of the teeth in his mouth. Yeah, this is definitely a dream. The fact that I can still talk without any teeth is proof of that. Having your teeth fall out is a common nightmare. Considering who I'm stuck with, it appears that we're trapped in one of those. Tim begins to examine his surroundings, stating that they both have derealization disorder symptoms, feeling like you're awake, but you're trapped in a dream. Batman's files on Dr. Destiny from the JLA computers talk about how to recognize if you're in the dreamscape. And if you can feel pain, you can most likely die here as well. So if this is all in their heads, great. And if not, they're in big trouble. I hate to admit it, but I think you're right. Considering the atmosphere in here just went from bad to worse, I'm gonna take your word for it. Some of the surroundings change again to a scene of a graveyard as two hands reach out, grabbing each of their legs. One voice tells Tim not to fret, little birds, and another voice tells Jason that this nightmare is only beginning. The two are then dragged and separated by the skeleton-like claws. As Tim yells, remember, things can actually hurt. Try and stay alive and I'll find you. Ha, <laughs> worry about yourself, Tim. If these things can hurt, then we can hurt them back. Just try to keep your head in the game. As Tim blinks, he finds himself in a familiar kitchen, his dad's apartment. And it's just as it was when, wait, no, no, no. He begins to panic as he realizes what's going on. He looks at the calendar to confirm his suspicions and realizes that this is the day that Captain Boomerang came and killed his father. Suddenly, Tim's father is yelling at Boomerang to get out of the house. So Tim runs over shouting to not try and fight. Just run, I'll save you, dad. Meanwhile, with Jason, he has a similar feeling as he wanders around a bunch of shipping containers. Beautiful. Brings back such lovely memories. And Tim, you better not be dreaming of your cushy bedroom back in the manor. But a voice chimes in. Jason, Tim isn't just as much hot water as you. Whoever said that, step out of the shadows before I start filling you with bullets. The figure then steps out. We are happy to oblige. But sadly for you, you're a little outgunned. Then Jason is struck in the back of the head with a crowbar. Back with Tim, he races down the hallway, calling out to his dad, telling him to hang on and he'll save him. He's gonna make it this time. He's going to. But as soon as he turns the corner, he hears a bang and a shlack. 
as he sees his father with a boomerang in his chest. Tim stumbles forward as he falls to his knees. His father tells him, You should have tried harder. You're supposed to save people. Soon a voice laughs. <laughs> I really hate to see it. Poor little hero gets the chance to change history and save his father and you still can't hack it. Can you, Tim? Tim looks up to see the voice is coming from a nightmare version of himself, but one that looks like our villain Insomnia. It goes on stating that he was supposed to be the Robin that made a difference. He wasn't drafted, he walked right in and demanded the role. So why is he so bad at being Robin? Why do you keep letting everyone down? Tim stares up trying to even process what is going on. And Insomnia asks, No answer! Beautiful! Then we'll just have to run it back! As Insomnia snaps his fingers, the world shifts once more, and Tim finds himself in the kitchen just moments ago. He hears his father arguing with Boomerang, and he asks, Do you think this is a game? Fine. Game on. Meanwhile, back with Jason, he begins to wake up from being attacked by his nightmare self. I hope you enjoyed that cheap shot, because it's the only one you're going to get. The hulking nightmare tells him, Good. You haven't given up yet. I was worried you'd thrown in the towel, like you did with dear old mom back at the warehouse. Say, how many times do you think you need to be hit in the head, like the Joker did before, before you beg Batman to come and save you? There's a gunshot, and Jason gets back up looking down at the nightmare. It's a little hard to run your mouth with a rubber bullet in it. For the record, I won't be calling Batman or anyone else for help. I don't need it. As Jason turns to leave, he pulls open the door and he sees dozens of heads, the floating heads of his mother. I'm sorry, Jason. He made me, Jason. He killed my little boy. The Joker killed my little boy. Jason steps back. What the hell is this? And the nightmare hulking version of Jason begins to split. Oh, please excuse Sheila's crying. This game isn't over yet. I forgot to explain the rules. They're really quite simple. They win until you die. Are you ready to play again? Jason grabs his gun. Yeah, round two, losers. Soon, the three nightmares split again into 10 nightmares. And just as Jason shoots one down, two more stand back up in its place. One nightmare head morphs into the Joker, telling him, face it, the red helmet that you wear is one step away from the man who put you down. You're going to die all alone here. And sooner or later, you're going to end up like me. <laughs> Jason opens fire on the nightmares. I'm here to put down nightmares like you. The nightmares laugh, asking, Oh, did we strike a nerve? Wonder how well the other little bird is holding up. Back with Tim, he runs into a room to see his father killed again and again. And Insomnia looks at him. Ha! Huh, 52 times and you've never even been close. Hate to say it, but it looks like it's over for you as Robin. You wouldn't even happen to have a backup career, would you? Tim turns his anger towards Insomnia and attacks, but the Nightmare dodges, striking back. I'll give you this, you're trying your best. It's just too bad that your best is never good enough. But as Tim is kicked away, he flies through the wall. I can't give up being Robin. And then a hand reaches out, telling him to take her hand. You don't have to keep doing this, we're here to stop it, Tim. Tim sees Stephanie and the others. Finally, I knew you guys would come. We gotta stop this twisted Robin. We have to save my dad and escape from... But Stephanie tells him that she never said anything about helping him. They're here to stop this. He thought he could have it all, that he was the best Robin that there was. Batman didn't have any training when his father died. What's your excuse, Tim? Now just stay back before anyone else gets killed. Everyone turns and leaves with Tim reaching out. Wait, you can't do this. You're one of my best friends. I can't lose you two. As Tim runs into the next room, he sees that they all, too, shared the same fate as his father. The Nightmare tells him, You wanted to carry the world on your wings, but you can't even keep the ones close to you alive. How do you wear that uniform? How do you call yourself a hero? How do you even go on breathing? Tim pushes the Nightmare away. Stop! Leave me alone! This little exercise isn't optional. I created it to teach you a lesson. Your last lesson, where are you going? Tim charges into his room, curling up on the bed. And that's when he hears bang and shlulk over and over again as his dad dies repeatedly. Until finally nightmare comes. 
he whispers into Tim's ear. Face it, you can't save anyone. You're going to get everyone killed someday, and then we're going to reset it again and again until you beg for death. Tim screams for him to shut up, but in that brief moment, he can hear Jason calling out to him. Tim asks, where are you? We gotta get out of here fast, Jason. Jason is standing, his back against the wall. Sounds like we're both in just as much hot water. I messed up. I messed up bad. Tim tells him that they just need to focus. They just need a plan. But back with Jason, dozens upon dozens of nightmares are inching closer. He's just made the situation worse. All right, you got to think of a good plan quick, because I'm at the end of my line. Tim tries to focus, telling himself that this isn't real. Through all the noise, Jason calls out to him, asking if he can hear him. Tim snaps out of it, asking if it's really Jason. Is he really there? And Jason takes another hit from his clones. Yeah, I'm pretty far from okay. And I can barely hear you with all the blood in my ears. With all the people in our little family. Did you ever guess that we'd be the ones dying together, Tim? Because things aren't looking too good here. Tim tries listening more, but as Jason's words fade... He thinks to himself that maybe Jason is right. Tim's nightmare version of himself says, That's what I wanted to hear. The sweet marinade of defeat just before death. Jason is cracked across the face once more with a crowbar and he tells them, Just end it already! What are you waiting for? He gets up banging on the locked door asking, Couldn't anyone else kill me? Penguin, Two-Face, no. It had to be my own nightmares that got me. He slams on the door once more, telling them that all he wanted was someone, anyone, that he could count on. And Tim hears Jason's plea. Jason? Where are you? I'm one too many steps over the edge, Tim. Jason looks over the edge that he is literally on and notices Tim is in a similar situation, stuck on his own. Looks like we're in the same boat. The Robin that's a failure is going to die along the Robin who thinks he's a failure. What? Are you kidding? No one thinks that you're a failure. Is that really what you think, Jason? It's what I know. You obviously don't know Jack Squat then. You didn't fail. Batman failed you. Your mother failed you. You did what we were all trained to do. Survive. Survive? To what? Become a monster? To kill people? To be perpetually alone? (laughs) You were never alone, Jason. You just pushed us away. That doesn't mean that we gave up on you. You have a lot to atone for, sure. But you're more than just your failures, and you're not alone. I'll always be here if you need me. (laughs) Of course. Because you've always been there in the past. Fine. Let's pretend you're telling me the truth. Then you better start taking your own advice. What do you mean? You're just like Batman. You think you can save everyone, but you can't. And you shouldn't put that on yourself. My dad died because I couldn't save him, Jason. I was trained by Batman and it was all for nothing. What if I can't save Bernard or Stephanie? What if I can't even get myself out of this? You weren't chosen to be a Robin, you demanded it. And thank God you did. Because you're damn good at it. We were chosen, you chose yourself. That takes a lot of guts. And you're not going to be able to save everyone, but you want to. And you'll never stop trying. That's what counts. (laughs) Huh. Thanks, Jason. Don't mention it. So now that we've agreed to not give up just yet, how do we beat these two? Tim tells them that they have to defeat themselves first. You game? And Jason tells them, you know it. I'm always willing to take myself down a peg. You aren't alone, Jason. And you're stronger than you think. Now let's show them what you've got. As Tim looks back at the door, he steps through the scene of his father being killed and his nightmare version, the insomnia version, asks... Did someone manage to pull you out of the void of despair? You know what that means, right? Time to break you all over again! The nightmare picks up Tim's father like a puppet. Where do you get off calling yourself my son? Since when did I raise a failure? You're just a little brat pretending to be a hero. Tim smacks his father's hand away. No! And the nightmare snaps his fingers. You don't get to say no! It's time for you to pay for what you did and what you're going to do. You're only gonna live long enough to watch your friends suffer because you're not good enough. Do you think Nightwing would let this happen? Or Barbara? What makes you so special? 
The world needed a Robin. So I became the best that I could be. Yes, people have died. More people might. I couldn't save my father and I accept that now. But that won't stop me from trying to save the others or beating this cheap nightmare coffee into paste. While Tim begins to find his rhythm, Jason too begins fighting back against his copies and he takes out his guns, tossing them to the side. One of the copies kicks the guns back. You have to pick them up and fight! But Jason sits back down. Why? Because I'm so good at doing what I've been told? No, I'm gonna try a different approach. I'm gonna wait for backup to arrive. The copies, again the insomnia versions, yell at him. No one is coming for you! You're alone! Do you know why no one ever comes? Yep. Because I never ask. Jason sits there for a few moments and he lets out a forced sigh. <sighs> Robin! Tim! I need your help! Back with Tim, his nightmare shouts, You're the one who did this! You're the one who killed your father! I can't save everyone, Tim tells him. But even if someone else dies, I'll never stop trying. Tim begins to rip the nightmare's cloak off. Because I don't break. I hope. I'm the light. The nightmare falls back, curling up. You won't save everyone! Your friends, your family, just give it up! And Tim says that he'd rather die trying. Right now, more than ever, one of them needs his help. Over with Jason, his nightmares begin to beat him over and over, using their crowbars, telling him, Fight back, or the next time we'll break your skull! <laughs> Jason just laughs. I'd love to see you try! Why don't we just wait for my friend to get here? I'm sure that's gonna go over well. One of the copies stabs Jason in the stomach, telling him that it's time for him to die. And he's going to die alone. No one is coming to save him. You're wrong. Drake, you want to do the honors? And a second later, Tim comes crashing through the barrier, feet first into one of the copies. As he lands, Jason looks at him. Ha, <laughs> took you long enough. But I didn't doubt you for a second. Now you ready to get some payback? And Tim smiles. Nothing would make me happier. The two begin to take on each other's nightmares with more determination than they ever have had before, easily winning over their fears and past traumas. And as the versions fade away, Tim says that that settles it. All right, now, how do we wake up? Jason looks out. Something tells me that's what we're about to find out. The world begins to shift and the two begin to roll away. I'll see you on the other side. I just hope you're alive on the other side. Jason wakes back up on the roof of the warehouse that he was on before he got sucked into the dreamscape and he looks over the edge at the stationed goons asleep. He radios it in. Anybody there? I need help. Robin? Oracle? Tim? A few silent seconds later, Tim radios back. Okay, this is bad. It could have been a lot worse, but this is bad. Are you okay? I fell asleep while driving my bike. I'm a little bruised and battered on the outside. You good? Jason says that he's getting there. It looks like there's still a big mess to clean up. Somebody probably needs a beatdown, and he might not be able to do it himself. Assuming you were really in that dream, you ready to make good on what you promised? Tim picks up his bike, riding it off. Always. I'm on my way, Jason. The heroes have lost. Insomnia's nightmare creatures have begun to spread across the world, and people are finally waking up. But now, they're being attacked by nightmare monsters and nightmare versions of their heroes. Insomnia stands triumphant in the front of the Hall of Justice, holding the Nightmare Stone aloft, gloating to Boston Brand and Sandman. With the Nightmare Stone, I can make the whole world understand. They will see what the so-called heroes have done to me, and they will fear them. And it's all thanks to you. Insomnia laughs as he turns to Dead Man, promising to give him the reward for bringing him the Nightmare Stone. No, we didn't have a deal. Boston gasps as black tendrils lift him into the air, carrying him inside of the Hall of Justice. Insomnia laughing and promising that he will give Boston his dreams. The world begins to swirl, and a Dead Man family appears before him. Your very own Dead Family. Insomnia cries, and the wife and children rush up to hug their father. The world swirls around them, and then they're standing in a cozy house. Take this gift, my friend. This will all be over soon. Insomnia whispers, but a voice calls out to him. Damn right it is. 
Batman growls as the awakened heroes enter the Hall of Justice. Your night of terror is due for a rude awakening. Batman hisses as the heroes rush forward. But then they are met by the swirling black tendrils of the nightmare world and the creatures that Insomnia is now able to call forth. Why do this? Why create these nightmares? Superman demands as he sends a blast of heat vision into the nightmare creatures. Insomnia laughs. I didn't make them. They were born inside of people's minds. I only opened up the door for them. He says, looking around the Hall of Justice, pointing out that it is strange that the so-called heroes would need a place to store trophies. What kind of heroes need trophies? I wonder what happens when your victories turn on you. He questions, and the Nightmare Stone begins to glow, and the relics from the Justice League's past begin to come to life, attacking them alongside the creatures from the Nightmare Realm. As the heroes continue to fight, Sandman turns to the body of Boston Brand, shouting for his new friend. Dead man! Can you hear me? Wake up! He bellows, and inside of the dreams, Dead Man is sitting with his family, but he hears the calls of his friends remembering the truth. Dead Man, can you hear me? Wake up! Sandman bellows, and inside of his dreams, Dead Man is sitting with his family, but he hears the calls of his friends and remembers the truth. None of this is right. This is not what I wanted. Boston stands up, forcing his way out of the dream and back into the waking world. You gave me what you wanted, and I'm not going to live in some dream while my friends are out here hurting. Dead Man snaps as he lunges at Insomnia in the real world, but Insomnia reaches out, grabbing Dead Man by the head. Let's finally have a look at what your nightmares are about! He growls, and Dead Man begins to scream as they both look at his nightmares. He sees himself alone, without a crowd to watch him. Dead Man lashes out, punching Insomnia across the face, knocking the villain away. And while Dead Man continues to fight against Insomnia, the rest of the heroes continue to battle the Nightmare creatures. We need to get back to where this all started. The Nightmare construct of John D's body. Batman shouts, and Superman nods, sending another blast of heat vision out. I'll clear a path. He shouts as the heroes rush out of the room, only Zatanna and Cliff staying behind, holding off the sleepless nights. Nearby, Dead Man and Insomnia are pushing away from each other. Nothing is gonna bring back your family, Insomnia. This doesn't honor them. Let's stop this together, Dead Man says, and Insomnia nods, admitting that the hero is right. But I've won. I wanted the entire world to know the truth, to know the monsters that the Justice League is. I win! Insomnia says as he reaches out, ripping Dead Man in half, and he begins to float up into the air. I know how to honor my family. I will punish the heroes! He bellows, and meanwhile, our heroes have found the body of Dr. Destiny. Batman reaches out, opening up the box that contains the Dream Stone. He was drawn here because of this. The Dream Stone gave him his powers. It might be able to counteract the Nightmare Stone, Batman says, and Sandman nods, stepping forward, picking up the stone. I've always felt a connection to it. He whispers, the power of the Dream Stone beginning to swirl around him. But Insomnia has arrived. He uses the power of the Nightmare Stone to begin transforming our heroes into their nightmare versions. You think you can handle the Dream Stone's powers, Dodds? You're nothing but some weak zombie. Old! You're out of your league. Insomnia laughs, but Sandman raises the stone and his pistol, telling Insomnia that the Nightmare Stone should never have been brought into the real world. Bring it, zombie! I'll kill you just like I killed dead man! Insomnia shouts, but a voice laughs behind him. Ha! You really fell for that? Faking death was my whole act. Dead man shouts as he flips into the room, grabbing a hold of Insomnia, and he begins to rip the Nightmare Stone away from him. The powers of the Dream and Nightmare Stone beginning to mix together, drawing both dead man and Insomnia into the white light, into the afterlife. Boston! You don't gotta do this! The Dreamstone can save you! Sandman shouts, but Deadman smiles back at him. This is what I wanted. I wanted to be the star again. I'm tired of being just a watcher. I want to see what's on the other side. Don't you hear it? They're cheering for me, Dots. Boston says as he disappears. Insomnia opens up his eyes in the swirling darkness, and he finds himself in his old apartment. His family cheers at his arrival, and they rush forward to hug him. I've missed you all so much, he says with tears in his eyes. But when he opens him, his children are his nightmares. 
We missed you too. They growl before setting upon him, beginning to bite into his flesh. He screams in pain as flames envelop him. Back in the waking world, the battle has ended and the world is safe once again. But Batman knows there is one thing that the heroes have left to do. They return Wesley Dodds to his grave. And as he crawls inside, he looks back at the generation of heroes that he preceded. Thank you all for one last adventure. But Dean is waiting for me. He says before laying down. Satana holds up the Dreamstone and says her backwards magic, restoring Wesley to his eternal rest once more. As they turn to leave the graveyard, Batman suddenly stumbles, collapsing to the ground, and Damien rushes to his father's side, shouting for help. It isn't long before Batman is in the Hall of Justice being monitored. Mr. Terrific explains that while Batman fought in the Nightmare Realm, Boston Brand possessed his body and pushed it way beyond the breaking point. I have no idea when he'll wake up, but I believe that he will eventually. Mr. Terrific tells Superman and Wonder Woman, probably more rested than he's ever been, Wonder Woman jokes. Diana and Clark then walk through the empty Hall of Justice, knowing that the people no longer trust them, that Insomnia's goals were met. The people have begun to fear the heroes that have sworn to protect them, to keep them safe. They don't know if they can trust the Justice League. Clark explains that he's going back to Supercorp to see what's going on with Lex and that whole situation. While Diana explains that there's a current situation over in DC, an anti-Amazonian front seems to be forming and she needs to go figure out what that is. Our heroes didn't win this battle and it's proven by a little girl in a house in Metropolis. She's pulling down the drawings that she made of her favorite heroes. They scare her now. Meanwhile, in a secret lair, Amanda Waller begins to speak to the members of a secret organization. She tells them that Insomnia's attack has actually aided their plans in turning the public against the heroes. She turns as one of the soldiers brings her the spoils of war. We found the helmet of hate on Lazarus Island, and Bright managed to steal the Nightmare Stone during the chaos. She says offering these weapons to someone in the shadows, someone whose name must remain secret from the world. The magical items fly across the room, empowering the shadowy figure. And what do you call yourself? Waller asks. Powerful magic lighting the room, revealing our new threat. Doctor Hate, he growls. Waller smiles, nodding. Phase two begins. The Justice League is now feared by the world, which means our next target is the Titans. And there you have it, Night Terrors, the next part of Dawn of DC. The next thing we'll be covering will be the Gotham War, and then we're going to be putting out Beast World, so you have all of the current Dawn of DC large-scale events. Then we'll start putting out a lot of the smaller stuff on this channel, Comic Story and Full Story, or as I'm lovingly calling it within the office, Classic Comic Story. Thank you, and don't forget to like and subscribe.